from what we sent earlier. This is the one you were on when you made it. Okay, so I don't need this. If it's a majority. Because it'll just confuse me. Okay. Not that I'm already confused enough. All right, good evening, everybody. I would like to call the town council meeting of Wednesday, September 4th to order. Um, the first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tony, roll call. Council Cloutier. Here. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Caterina? Uh, here. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Chairman Hayes? Here. Um, good evening. The first item on the agenda is, agenda is general public comments, and I think what we're going to do, this will be the place if, if folks are here to talk about the revaluation and share any comments with us, this would be the place. But before we get there, I think the town manager, Tom, was going to do some introductory remarks and kind of bring us up to date to where we are in the process and, and the things that are going on. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we do have Dave Buffard, the ta tax assessor, here tonight. But uh, before perhaps he takes the podium, um, I'd like to make a couple of introductory remarks, kind of housekeeping, if you will. Uh, so Mr. Buffard did set the tax rate uh, Tuesday morning. It's set at $14.70 per thousand. Uh, we've tried to get that word out. I know there was press coverage through the Press Herald. Uh, we've used our own communication channels, but I'll use this one as well. Um, just a couple of uh, highlights about the revaluation process. There were approximately 800, excuse me, 8,800 parcels that were revalued over the course of the last nine months or so. Um, our outside firm um, conducted that process with the uh, oversight of certain account staff. But I think it was important to have an outside perspective come into our community uh, without any kind of uh, objective other than trying to be fair and, and accurate in their work. Um, they did release their new values uh, early in August. All of us received uh, a, a notice at our homes uh, regarding those new values. And then we embarked on a process whereby uh, taxpayers who had questions, concerns, comments, uh, were able to come in, meet with our consultants, uh, share some of those details. And in fact, in, in the end, we had over almost 1,250 uh, different individual hearings that were held. Um, of that, uh, I believe we had just over 1,000 of those uh, meetings uh, produced some level of adjustment. Some of them were very small. Um, many of them probably were based on kind of factual errors in terms of how we described uh, individual properties. And, and um, I mentioned that uh, just to show kind of the success rate. And, and I, was really amazed by the amount of interest and the fact that people came out. And from my perspective, this is you know one of the demonstrations how the process worked. Um, in hindsight, I wish we had a little more time to study those values before they went out to all of us. I, I think we probably could have avoided some of those hearings. But at the end of the day, uh, because all of you were engaged and involved, um, we're, we feel really good about the values that we've committed. Now, having said that, uh, and through the process, I should mention, and perhaps Mr. Bufar can speak to this in more detail, um, during the last three weeks or so, he and his staff were doing kind of internal quality checks as well. And fairly early on, uh, there were a couple of areas of town that uh, really jumped out um, and deserved some further attention. Uh, the Hillcrest area and Pinecrest, uh, and also uh, Higgins Beach and some other selected areas, uh, kind of in the waterfront areas. And in fact, uh, under uh, Dave's direction, um, certain adjustments were made to those areas to, to bring them back to a, a more equitable position. Um, so at this point, for all of us uh, going forward, now that the values are committed, the tax rate is set, uh, we are going through the process of printing and sending out tax bills. Those will go out the week of September 15th. Um, we had in we had hoped, frankly, to include property cards, the updated property cards with the tax <coughs> bill. Uh, we've got some challenges of timing there, and we're still exploring actually sending out individual uh, mailers, if you will, uh, to homeowners, and I'm hopeful to report to council in the next day or two uh, about that process. Um, but now that we've committed the values, the next step for us as taxpayers, if you still have questions or concerns, 
is uh, is to uh, avail yourself of, of uh, our tax assessor who actually has made himself available for as long as needed, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday of each uh, each week, and at least in the evening hours. He's scheduling 30-minute appointments with folks to sit down and go through um, and, and work through their questions and comments and concerns. Um, so it's officially the abatement uh, period, but we want to make that as easy and kind of remove any barriers that might exist. So please do avail yourself of the opportunity to meet with the assessor, explain your concerns, uh, and I assure you, you know, those comments will be taken into consideration. Uh, beyond that, we all have 180 days to file a formal abatement if you still disagree with value, uh, so that there's a fairly long lead time, and, and again, that's your right as a taxpayer to uh, to do that within that 180-day period. But uh, we're expecting that we'll have a lot of ongoing questions in the coming weeks, and we'll do our part to be uh, as attentive and responsive to those as possible. Um, so with that, I, I'd like to... Welcome Dave Buffard, if that would please the council. Uh, I think it may be, may be challenging to provide too many comments without getting into particulars, but I'm sure he'll be willing to take questions as well. So I don't know if you have any overall comments to, to make. Well, uh, at this point, uh, the process that we're uh, going through right now is that we're taking phone calls from people who have concerns. And we understand that uh, a lot of people have not seen their property cards. So what the first thing we're doing is asking them to come into the office. Uh, you can print them the card. They can look it over. And if they see any errors, uh, mistakes. Uh, Excuse me. I don't mean to interrupt, but can we do a sound check to make sure that we have audio for David? Because uh, we've been having a bad, bad record of that. So uh, is someone, can someone in the booth confirm that? Or maybe... Okay, so, and people at home can hear it? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, so, so uh, we're asking them to come into the office. Uh, we can print them the card. They can look it over. We can help them uh, make corrections. Uh, and then if they have any further issues, they can make an appointment to come in and sit with me, uh, review the property card and, and, these, and the values, and, uh, you know, we can take it from there. As Tom said, if you're not happy with, uh, with the results, you can file a proper abatement request. Uh, I'm trying to avoid having many people do that directly. Uh, I'd rather they come in and we have an informal talk and, and see if we can resolve any issues informally before, before taking the, the next step, which is to go before the that's where we're at. Uh, the phones have been busy, and we're trying to uh, accommodate people. Uh, we're scheduling them to come in, and uh, so uh, you know, it's just going to go till it's over. <coughs> so, if there's any questions uh, from the uh, council or the floor, um, let's start with it. Any any questions from the councilors? Dave, I wanted this. I uh, just want to thank you for the extra efforts of you and your staff to, um, you know, to work diligently to try to make adjustments and to offer extra time that was not conceived originally. But can you can you share with us why it did seem that there were a lot of errors? Can you share with us why uh, we did not have a step a, f a fact checking step before the you know the original assessments were and appraisals were made? In many other towns, it was very clear there was a, after the appraisals, appraisers went through the homes, they sent that out to homes and had them validated. And that was a step that was very thorough, very comprehensive, and something that was done before the calculations were made. And that afforded people an opportunity to get the, the errors out of the system before we, we got into the situation that we're in now, which is chasing, chasing errors and doing it after the fact. I think it's a matter of procedure, uh, depending on the company that's doing the revaluation. In this case, KRT, uh, they made an effort to get into the, the buildings, and if they were able to, then they had the property owners review the information and sign off. Uh, if no one was there, then they had to do, uh, they, they did a, a 
measurement of the building and a estimated based on the exterior inspection. Um, and then um, and then they sent the uh, you know in the end they sent out the information to the property owners. Uh, I think it comes down to the quality of the the staff. Uh, with these companies uh, there's a lot of turnover. So they hire a lot of people and have to train them. Uh, if they don't have much training, you know, you lose a little bit of quality. I'd also say that it's a function of timing. Uh, the same company conducted our commercial industrial reval uh, with those good values coming out about, about a year ago. Uh, we engaged them to do the residential component, which they started uh, late September, maybe the 1st of October. And we knew that it would be a challenge to uh, work through the community to do it as thoroughly as could be possible. And we actually had uh, bi -week, uh, monthly milestones and, uh, and, and kept on top of them to make sure. And, and even with that, uh, we found ourselves really compressed on the back end. So and, I, and I, KRT I, also sends people out to do reviews, to review the, the work uh, of the initial inspectors. Uh, so that was in a way that was a quality control step. Uh, but again, uh, you know, they did the best they could under the cir circumstances. And also with the, uh, with the hearings, they were able to uh, correct a lot of mistakes. Great, thanks Dave, thank you. And Councilor Johnson. So I, I believe that the total valuation of the residential side of town has been reduced up approximately $48 million since the KRT evaluation, is, is that correct? correct? Do you know how much of that is from your office and how much of that was from KRT's meetings? I, I don't have a specific number I can give you. That's, uh, that's right. We, we reduced a lot of value at Higgins Beach and also at Hillcrest. Were there any other neighborhoods that that had that global adjustment or, or though, are those the only uh, two specific some, ones? Uh, there were some at Pine Point, Pillsbury Shores that uh, that I changed, uh, uh, not the majority, but there were some there and here and there. But mostly uh, the the biggest chunk was uh, Hillcrest and Higgins Beach, um, and KRT reduced a lot of values uh, through their hearings as well. So it may be half and half. I'm not sure. Okay. I've asked for that report, so I'm, okay. I'm yeah. interested in that data, and yeah. I'll certainly share it with council, with the public, in terms of uh, where that breakdown, where the adjustments happened. Can you give us Thank a little you. more detail on, I, I think both of those communities, Hillcrest and Higgins, accounted for most of that $48 million. Can you talk just generally about what, what caused that to be so overvalued that resulted in the adjustments, and then two... And Higgins Beach, the Portland Press said that it was a it was across the board ten percent decrease. Was it across the board, or was it specific well, at areas, Higgins, zones? At Higgins Beach, uh, I, I think they were fairly aggressive in setting the land values. Uh, also, they used a certain methodology uh, uh, to account for ocean views. Uh, which, which I don't agree with. So I, I went through, looked at all the properties. Uh, basically, if a property had a tall building with an ocean view, they gave more value to the land, uh, even though the, uh, the lot next door may be exactly the same and, and had a lower value because it didn't have a, an ocean view. Uh, so I made those corrections and then uh, the Looking at the, the new values compared to the sale prices, uh, we realized that they had pushed the values up, um, so the ratio was over 100%, then about 110. So, so we had to dial that back. But was that a software issue, or I mean, why why would they just over you know well, over appraise Higgins Beach and not? They they you know they they assign values to the lots that they thought were appropriate. But it didn't happen at Pine Point. It didn't happen at other sort of beach-facing. Uh, right, right. Uh, it's it's 
part of the process when you do a revaluation. You, you go through a neighborhood and you reset the guidance, then you look at it and to see where it falls in regards to the sales. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's not unusual. Hillcrest is a unique situation where the sale prices reflect the units, but there's also an intrinsic value added to that. Uh, as one person described it, it's, a, it's the privilege to be there. Uh, and there are communities like that. Uh, so uh, KRT was aiming to get the assessments up to what people were paying. Put all the value in the buildings, so we had to dial that back. <clears throat> but but the view issue didn't happen in any other sort of assessment across the town. The view issue. Well, uh, a assign additional value for views. It sounded you know it sounded like that was a major component in Higgins Beach and why you made the downward right. adjustment. Right. But there's lots of other there, properties. Well, there were some at Pine Point and Pillsbury mm -hmm. Shores, uh, and those have. Been Um, yeah, I, I want to thank staff. Um, it's, this is a slog, I know, um, with the assessing. And I know that people I've talked to who have met with their staff have been pretty satisfied. Maybe they're not totally happy, but they're satisfied. So, you know, thank you for doing that. Um, I also know from my own experience in real estate that in the state of Maine, uh, setting values on properties is extremely hard because we don't have, like California, where you have every house looks exactly the same in a development. It's more like comparing apples and oranges and limes and trying to make adjustments thereof. So uh, I'm happy to hear that the assessors are willing to continue working on that. And I encourage people to make the phone calls if you're still not sure of what was done correctly. Uh, we're here. That's why we're here. So make sure you call the assessors. I do have uh, two questions that have come up to me from constituents. One is, why was Prout's Neck not valued or some reductions in value there? And then the second one is, how many of the uh, cards, excuse me, the valuations that had to be adjusted or you decided to adjust, people either weren't home or did not let the assessor in. And then after the fact, they're like, well, wait a minute, you made a mistake. So if you could... The first one is Prout Snack. Yeah. Why was that? Uh, when this started, uh, we, did some, we did some studies in different areas uh, to determine what the ratios were. Uh, this goes back to when we started with the commercial legal. Mm -hmm. uh, the commercial properties uh, the ratio was below 70 percent. Uh, the residential, on average, was about 85 percent. Mm -hmm. Crossneck was at about 122 uh, percent. So there was a clear indication that the prices there were, uh, were coming down and the assessments that had been set for many years uh, were, were simply too high. And that's mostly, that was mostly with the waterfront problems. Mm -hmm. On the interior of Crossneck, it's a mixed bag. Some, some of those assessments went up and some went down uh, because there was a lot of irregularity uh, with the interior properties. Mm -hmm. I guess in the past there was more focus on the waterfront mm -hmm. to make yeah. sure that those were accurate. Uh, but clearly the sales have shown us that, uh, that things have changed there. Uh, values, are, people are not paying what they used to. Values are going down. And if you don't mind, my just our values going down. And, well, let me back up a little. When you did your analysis, were you looking at just Prout's next sales, or do you make that wider because that's such a specialty <coughs> market? Well, I did. I did a number yeah. of sales, waterfront sales in general, um, and uh, Pine Point sales. Okay. Sales. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then that not home, do you have any idea or is that something we could look at? You know, that people who came in that were concerned 
they, uh, an assessor w was not able to get into the house? Because uh, people don't always call and get permits and whatever for things, and we don't know changes have been made. So. Are you concerned that we didn't get the correct information? No, no, I'm not concerned about that. I'm just, I don't have a concern about that because I know there's a certain number of people that were like, I'm not letting an assessor in, I don't care, you know, which is fine, and that was their right to do so, and then people weren't home. Um, when someone came and even when they went for the second sweep so I was just curious if you knew how many of these people asking for corrections had not had an assessor into the interior of their well, house well the inspectors put notes on the cards yep uh, whether or not they did an interior inspection or right they were not able to get there or they refused entry yeah uh, there are notes on I was just wondering if there was a correlation at all, or I don't know if it's significant mm -hmm. or not. Well, if someone uh, questions their, their value and they refuse the entry, then uh, the solution is for them to let us in. So right, right. Yeah, I, I asked the question. That information isn't readily available um, <clears throat> just because it wasn't recorded right. um, for that purpose. But that's not to say we can't uh, assemble that information. Uh, it would require us to look back through the cards of the 1,200 or so that had hearings and, and determine whether or not yeah. there was an interior even, inspection. Even now, if someone calls and, and says, I want, to, I want to have a meeting with you because I don't like my value, it's too high, and yeah. uh, if I see, you know, if they really dispute the value and, and I question them and, and I suspect that uh, you know, there could be something else there, Yeah. Uh, for me, it's as much, I, I had just had a couple people ask it as much as curiosity questions, so I don't want yeah, I, you to do a I trip to whatever on it. A lot of people seem to be concerned with their, with their neighbors, and yeah. they want to make sure their neighbors are paying their fair share, too. Right. Uh, and that's understandable. Yeah. If I could just offer some historical perspective, Dave has been with us for almost two years now. Um, I've had the occasion to work with three different assessors. And when I came, Paul Lesperance was here. He had 28-year uh, experience with, with the town. Yep. And then we went through a couple of other ones in the interim before Dave came, both extremely qualified assessors. I can tell you that um, Prouds Neck has been an interesting and a bit of a vexing uh, challenge to all prior assessors because of the lack of sales, at least sales that we had confidence that were arm's length and a bona fide transaction that hit the market and were tested in the market. Interestingly, in the last uh, two years or so, there's been a flurry of sales that give some level of confidence that they are arm's length. And so uh, what that confirmed, and I think you reported that the ratio was over 120%, is that over time there was a bit of a superinflation in values there because we didn't have a way to validate it in the market. But we now have data that suggests uh, that there needs to be a, a correction. And I bring that up just for the historical piece, but also it's probably the best example of what this is all about. It's using data help to help us understand uh, the best way to have equity in the tax burden share. And uh, some go up and some go down. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and to get back to your point uh, regarding <coughs> We also have the old cards that right. have information. Uh, it's generally good, reliable information. Of course, uh, we always run into situations where people have made improvements oh, yeah. to the old permits, and mm. uh, those don't get uh, picked up. Yeah, I run into that frequently when I'm listing houses. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, didn't, I don't think this is for Mr. Buffard as much as it is for the town manager, but you said when KRT puts together the data that they're going to share with us, my question was kind of in line with uh, Councillor Katerina in that, one, I'd be curious to know of the <coughs> exact number of hearings we had, what percentage of those actually got adjustments. So if 1,200 people came through our door, did 1,150 of them actually get adjustments? A, a thousand three, so a thousand three I would out say of twelve hundred, eighty percent or so. Okay, which shouldn't be shocking. Folks coming in are coming in because they think there's uh, a problem, and we right. That. It just bears a concern for me of all the folks out there who still have concerns that haven't 
figured out how to access or use the process to come in and do that. And, and it's incumbent upon us, I think, to make sure that they know how to, to do that still. Sure. Um, and then um, I was curious about Jean Marie's question as well. Will KRT have, because they know exactly who got, you know, who the, where they had access and where they did not, will they be able to t share with us afterwards of the ones that we had to make adjustments? Um, it was it was the non-access a big issue in terms of yeah. uh, that's really what you were getting at, right, Jim? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Again, each card has the note whether they had interior inspection or not. I don't believe that's the answer I received anyway that they they tracked it uh, right along. <coughs> so we'd have to assemble it. And it's but certainly possible do to do. Okay. Yeah. KRT is contractually obligated to provide us manuals and some some details of their whole methodology. I must admit, I've seen the one for the commercial uh, process. Uh, it's not likely to be all that helpful and instructive to us. So um, I'm interested in assembling other information I think might be more relevant and easier for us to understand in, of more use. Uh, there may be some conversation later about uh, having a workshop, and, and we would welcome the opportunity to be able to, in a more informal setting, if you will, with the certainly public present, to delve into some of the details and the sales analysis and those sorts of things. Councilor Johnson. Have you worked, uh, I'm assuming you've worked with a third party in this context before? Can you speak to this experience versus previous experience? In your career, I'm sure you've had, you've dealt with a third party that's had to reval re the entire town before and then you're enacting assessor after the fact. No, I, I've helped someone to okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. But as far as this relationship between a third party and then it kind of gets kicked back to you, that's that's not. It's it's. Uh, I know it's very normal. I just didn't know if is, you could speak to an uh, experience that you've had without. That's not this one, but if you can't, that's completely well, fine. I can't as as an assessor. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I've not been a chief assessor somewhere else. Right. 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 And do you have any thoughts as far as the way that this has played out versus the town of Gorham a few years ago? I mean, or? This is pretty standard. Okay. Uh, right. yeah. And uh, uh, this company does have a lot of experience. Uh, they've done a lot of work in Maine. Uh, and I did, I did call a number of towns in Maine who had used them before, and, and they pretty much gave me uh, positive feedback. Um, thank you. Uh, so now that you've been spent two years revaluing pretty much every property in town, uh, I have two questions. But the, the first is, looking back, is there anything you'd do differently? Are there any lessons learned that you'd take away? Should we have to do this again? And then the, the other question that somebody asked me today was, when, we sell, when properties change ownership, do we look at them to update their values? Or are there any triggers that... Um, that might cause us to revalue a property outside of a revaluation? No, when, when a property sells, we don't, we don't go in and change the values. Uh, that would be what we call chasing sales. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would, make it, uh, it would make it unfair for that property. It would that value and not everyone else in the uh, especially when the market's going down. Uh, uh, when the first question, is there anything you'd do differently or, or, or any takeaways that you have? I, I would have preferred to have more time mm -hmm. uh, to review everything before commitment, but we just didn't have that luxury. Uh, and I certainly don't like the idea of waiting 14 years to do what we've done. Uh, mm. Actually, the state mandates it should be done in 10 years. Uh, there, is, there is a process could be done that the state encourages, and that's to review every property in town once every four years. So you can split the town into four sections and review all four sections over a period of four years and then update those values. And you can also do statistical updates, uh, which would not require uh, inspection. So, 
Sorry, one more follow-up. There, there's, it's been suggested that we might be able to stick with the old values for the October tax payment and then go with the new values in April. Can you speak to that and if there's any complications that, that might arise from that approach? I don't know how you could do that. Uh, for one thing, uh, the plan was to do the commercial revaluation last year, implement those values, and then do the residential uh, evaluation this year and, and implement the, uh, the residential values this year. We waited another year. In other words, last year, Commercial properties took the hit, so to speak. Uh, the residential properties saw their taxes pretty much stay uh, even. Uh, if we did that again this year, it, it really would be unfair to the commercial properties to, uh, to force them to bear more of the burden. Uh, so this way, we're equalizing them. This year, the, the residential values are seeing their the residential properties seeing their values go up, uh, and the commercial properties uh, their values are staying the same. So when the tax rate declined, uh, they're seeing their taxes go down. Uh, last year they went up, this year they're going down. So, so it's, I, I think it's a fairly fairly good way to do it. Uh, Thank you. Could, could I just uh, answer maybe specifically a question uh, from Councillor? Um, the question was related to can we build the first half on the old value and the second half on the new value? I asked that very question to Justin Poirier. He's the Director of Property Tax uh, uh, Division of Maine Revenue Service, uh, actually Dave's former employer. Um, and there's a there's a, certainly a legal challenge there because w essentially we c we can commit once every year mm -hmm. and it's value as of April 1st and so I think there's a legal challenge and there's a huge practical challenge and I think it would certainly cause difficulty internally but also confusion in the public so the only option I guess in uh, somewhat close to that would be to simply delay the implementation for a full year and I think Mr. Buffard spoke to the potential negative ramifications of that. Um, but the fact is we've committed uh, values and, and at this point there's no retracting that as far as I know. Uh, David, uh, I understand that uh, taxpayers have been uh, contacting you and uh, asking for consideration of their own circumstances. For how long a period of time will you be open to be able to answer people's questions and consider their pleas for uh, adjustments? Uh, as long as it takes. Uh, we're scheduling three days a week uh, for uh, meetings, uh, one evening a week, and uh, hopefully it won't go beyond December. Uh, if it does, he won't care. He's <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that. It's good to be retired. Thank you, David. So, Council I'd just like to make a comment on that, the last exchange. Actually, it's 185 days after commitment yes. date that people have, if I'm, right. if I'm correct. So that will go beyond the date that they we could, have your services. They could for abatement up to 185 days. So if you're gone, then you know someone else, hopefully, sure. in yeah. the office will be doing that. Right. So... The, the question I had is a lot of this is about setting expectations and a couple of key data points that were <coughs> communicated um, were number one that uh, you know our tax rate of 16.49 will go down it'll go down somewhere in the range of something to 12 to 14 a new rate of 12 to 14 percent well we blew the high end of that range 14.7 so that's one expectation that went out the window. The other expectation was, uh, you know, insur assurances formally and informally that, well, as a, a town, our residents should expect that roughly a third of you will have a decrease, a third of you will have no change, and a third of you will experience an increase. How well did we do on that metric? And if, 
If we don't know, when will we know? I, I can't give you statistics in that regards, but uh, I think under normal circumstances, that's probably what happens. Uh, but with a 14-year gap or, or period between the last revalve and this revalve, uh, values have gone up significantly in 14 years. So that sort of eliminates that idea that some will go down and some will stay the same. Some, some problems did go down. So uh, just one quick follow-up, and, and I'll um, you know, thank you for the time and all your effort. But I've been learning by sitting in on some other meetings recently that the sort of, quote, there's a, you know, a rule of law. Taxation, taxation is the rule, but exemption, or, or in, this, in our case, abatement, is the exception. So the worry I have is that we, you know, up until now, um, you know, um, we, it seems as if we are placed the burden on residents to to find and address issues and to obtain adjustments. If we look back at the big adjustments that contributed to the 48 million, that was a major driver in that 14.7 uh, percent uh, tax rate. It. These were category errors, and I, I think it's safe to say, I, I, I think the residents at Hillcrest and Pinecrest, we get flooded with emails, we got or, more emails on that than, than anything until we made the adjustment the day, the day of the last council meeting. So those, those came from, from residents, and then, as I understand it, you know, Piper, we did some analysis. So, so going forward, are we gonna be doing more analysis to identify other issues, or are we gonna rely entirely on uh, you know, on residents, and I'm particularly worried about those that may not be in a community that has a, a well-organized association that can represent them and plead their case and go meet with you and have extra meetings and, and really do a great job of advocating. Um, or, or they have, you know, folks like us, we've identified a category area. What, what about those folks that we heard about last week who came up and said something happened, I don't have my property card, I don't know what to do. What, how do we help them? And, and we still haven't released detailed property cards. Well, we're still available uh, to anyone who has concerns. Uh, and we can, we can provide them with a property card uh, and uh, help them uh, examine their property cards and answer any questions that they may have. Uh, when it comes to your assessment, it's really up to you property owner to make sure that they're properly assessed. Uh, we can't do that. Uh, with 10,000 parcels here and now, we can't, you know, we can't scrutinize every single property to make sure that, that they're fairly assessed. Uh, on an annual basis, maybe the assessor can, uh, can review as much as uh, he can, he or she can, adjustments where they need to be made uh, because uh, different areas of town, different neighborhoods do move in different directions at different speeds in terms of value. Uh, so there's always adjustments you can make. It's, uh, it's always sort of a moving target. If I could just respond to the expectation comment, uh, Councillor. Uh, I think it's a fair criticism, frankly, of the uh, com uh, you know, conversation early on about the expectation of what we should expect, the one-third, one-third, one-third. That is a commonly used adage, and I think it actually is appropriate in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, we should have anticipated that that wasn't going to be the case here, and I think that's a fair criticism, frankly. Uh, with respect to uh, the, the estimated tax rate, uh, I can assure you the assessor uh, would loathe, was loathe to even talk about such matters, but given the circumstances, we felt as though it, was help, it would be helpful to help um, gauge what, those, what that expectation was. Clearly, we didn't anticipate there would be as many adjustments, and that was the difference uh, in not making that. In the end, it was just uh, under 11%. Um, I, I don't think we should be criticized for that. We're trying to do the right thing. Left to our own devices, we wouldn't have predicted it at all. But it certainly wasn't David's work. It was 
it was uh, mine and, and others. Can I, uh, thanks, Tom. I appreciate your response. Uh, thank you for that. Um, but I did want to ask, how will we account for future adjustments? We're going to have additional meetings. It's very likely we're going to have other adjustments that will amount to some figure. How will that be handled? Our commitment date is done. So where does that get booked and how does it get paid? Sure. We have an annual overlay account uh, whose express, which express purpose is to fund any abatements that are granted after commitment. Um, uh, this tax rate assumes uh, and includes something in the order of $260,000 in overlay. Uh, we've done, a, I think, a more thorough analysis this year than we ever have in terms of what we expect, um, and, and we think that will be sufficient to cover any abatements that are granted from this point forward. I think one of the, the valid concerns people have had is that the uh, uh, tax sheets that they have for their own individual properties have references on them that are not readily discernible. Uh, and so, uh, and I understand that some communities have put out informational pieces that have explained what those all mean for taxpayers. I suggest that as something that would be beneficial for us to do. I also want to make sure people realize <clears throat> you're not losing, after 185 days, six months, Yes, for this tax year, you have extinguished your right to appeal the taxes. Or just go in and talk to David, call him up on the phone or email him and say, here's my concerns, and deal with it on the phone or by, or by email. But as soon as the new tax bills come out, a year from now, you have all the right in the world. You may think you've lost the opportunity. You haven't. It renews every single time you get a new tax bill. Uh, you have the right to appeal it. So you may think that, ah, I'm a little nervous about this, I'm sitting on my rights, don't feel bad. And, and I know there's a number of realtors and uh, lawyers like myself who really, if you're concerned that you have a little anxiety about dealing with this, call us because we'd be happy to help you. Mm -hmm. Council Um Kind of piggyback on what Councillor Hamill was saying. Is there a mechanism where, if let's say you have two people that come into your office for Mitchell Hill Road, and you've decided, hey, these two, the, the, you know, these two people did need a second look? Is there a mechanism where you would then look at the area, or is it is it truly on each individual person in a given neighborhood? I'm trying to kind of piggyback on what Mr. Hamill was well, saying. I sort of do that with every yeah. Okay. Yeah. At this point in the timeline, is there a time that you would take the initiative to to do that? If there, like I said, if there was one neighborhood that you saw two or three times, would you actually take the initiative to look at the when I? Is, is that appropriate for you to take that initiative? Not you, like, is it appropriate to do that? Could you do that? Yeah. Could you say, okay, these 20 houses? Yeah. Okay. Not, not this week. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I don't, but that's, that, that, that opportunity is not lost, so to speak. So if there is pockets in this town, yeah. and- that would, be, that would be a red flag telling me okay. there, is, there could be something wrong with this neighborhood. Yep. Maybe the neighborhood code needs to be adjusted. Yep, down yep, and, okay. Uh, And my second question and final question is to the town manager: mm -hmm. Is two hundred fifty thousand? That's a pretty aggressive. That's a pretty aggressive overlay, or is that? Do you feel comfortable with that? As far as that's a fairly typical amount. Okay. Uh, but are we in a typical situation? That's well, that would be that's my a concern. Fair question. We scrutinize that, Dave and yeah. myself. One yeah. of the final decisions. Right. Right. And that's our 250. That's that's what we budgeted for this fiscal year, correct? Correct. Okay. So we're looking at a pretty skinny overlay compared to what we have in the pipeline and on a couple different angles. I don't know if I'd agree with the characterization skinny. of yep. skinny, but yep. uh, we think it's adequate to cover the expected abatement costs. Okay. Right. So I, just a follow-up question on that. If we do the math 
on what's been spent so far. I'm not a math guy, but this is a basic question. If we've spent 48 million on how many adjustments have been made so far? Roughly 1,000, you said? So if we've done 1,000 and that cost us 48 million, we got 250K left. Uh, if you use that, you know, average adjustment, uh, that ain't gonna take us too far, I don't think. Well, just appreciate, uh, the 48 million is in, is in value as opposed to the 260 okay. is in actual taxes uh, that taxes. would be abated. So okay. you're talking about two different things. Okay. But, um, the, tax, just, the taxes are on a million dollars. A million. Is, is 14,000. That were, that were abated so far, so not, okay, I understand. So thanks for, thanks for correcting me. I'm expecting most of the issues that we run into from now on will be minor. Uh -huh. Issues for the most part. Uh, things like uh -huh. uh, the flooring wasn't correct. Uh, you know, just simple uh, things. Okay. For the most part. But if you stay with my argument, and thanks for the correction, and now you know I'm not a math guy, but if you stay with that <laughs> argument, that would mean uh, if we have, you know, at a, what is it, $100,000 per, it'd be, we're, we're going to be overreaching our overlay by, twofold if we have half as many people coming forward to you know get adjustments no I mean what's the average what's what's the average on uh, a million over yeah, a thousand really 20 people? million right. it's what's the assessed value change equate to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars well, I, I think the point is if we fall short on the overlay that's going to run into next year's budget. It, it, yeah. you know, they've committed the tax rate already. Yeah. So it, you know, any abatements that come through, more or less than expected, will have a, a carryover effect on next year's okay. budget. And actually, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't we in prior years, we've actually booked a little additional overlay for some of the contingent liabilities yes. we know that's out there. So True. technically... We do have some additional overlay reserves, if you will, okay. that we have generated in the past because we do have some sure. outstanding things pending. So there is, a, there is that sort of safety valve, if you will. In the way that works, any overlay that's unspent, and at least during the, my entire tenure in this town, in fact, my whole time in this profession, uh, I've never had to, abatements haven't out, outpaced uh, the available outlay. Uh, overlay, and so in that case, that extra money becomes fund balance. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, conversely, if we find ourselves in the situation of needing to pay out more than the overlay is, that money comes from fund balance. Yep. Um, so uh, abatements will be that are granted will be uh, yep. satisfied. So I, I guess with that, this was supposed to be public comment. I think, <laughs> I think we've exhausted our, ourselves. Um, at this point, I'd welcome, thank you very much for your candid answers, and, <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for all your efforts in trying to Thanks serve everybody. Thanks thank you. Dave. Thank you, Dave. Um, with that, I'll open it up to public comment, but anybody is interested to come up and speaking at the podium as it relates to anything that's not on the agenda, which is, mm -hmm. yeah. which is the tax revamp. <clears throat>
the town of York has something like 55 assessing neighborhoods. Provide statistical summaries showing the median sales ratios by neighborhood, by building type, by construction quality, the size of the house, the price of the house. These are all um, standard statistical um, validation studies that should be done as part of the whole process. Put the numbers online, and I'm talking about the median sales ratio and the coefficient of dispersion. Not everyone is going to look at this information, but there are plenty of number crunchers out there and um, that will appreciate them. Please, just put the information online. Show us the data. Send out the property cards. This year, I'll be paying $12,390 for me and most people in this town this is our largest single bill for God's sake put send me my property card and one one final thing I would really like to see the town post the originally proposed assessments for Higgins Beach along with the revised assessments we taxpayers would really mm. like to see nice. all the changes that were made Thank you. Would anybody else like to come forward this evening? Is this issues that are also on the agenda beyond the actual big issue? This is for public comment for anything that's not on the agenda this evening. So to the extent if you want to speak to something that's on the agenda, there'll be public comment when we get to that agenda oh. item. Does that, does that, that help? Um, anything else, anybody? Paul O'Brien, Bob, you had you mentioned earlier that you wanted to hear some of the feedback of issues that people were having. Um, I kind of blame KRT for not sending out the property cards with the letters that went out, as other prop other uh, appraisal companies do, like Tyler Technologies is going to do for Portland and beyond. Um, when I got my summary online, not the property card, but just the summary that KRT put out, I noticed three errors. So I made my appointment, went to KRT, pointed them out. She said, oh yeah, that'll make a difference. Yeah, that'll make a difference. One thing, when I, when I viewed the property card last night, there was one thing she didn't write down, another thing that she wrote down wrong, and another thing that, um, anyway, it's still wrong. There's still errors in it. And I'm thankful that he's going to extend the period of time because I have no faith in KRT at this point, I, twice. And I did let them into my house because I didn't have anything to hide. I had permits for everything, you know, and I, I just, I don't get it. I think KRT should have sent out the property cards to begin with. I think out of 1,200, if there's 1,000 that have something wrong, that's a large percentage of the ones that have things wrong. Um, I don't know. I didn't write it down, so off the top of my head, that's, that's what I have. I'm, I'm thankful again that he's going to meet with people, and hopefully the third time around, someone can get it right. You know, I don't mind paying my fair share. I, you know, corrected all the permit issues years ago or whatever. Anyway, so that that's my experience. And Thank you. Anyone else this evening? Seeing none, I'll close general public comment. The next item on the agenda is item number five, which is the approval of the minutes from August 28th. Motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second, anybody? Second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, any discussion, any edits, any changes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Uh, there are no adjustments to the agenda. I've, I've signed the treasurer's warrants. 
Um, the first item on the agenda, order number 19058, uh, 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the order, order authorizing issuance of up to one million and fifty thousand in bonds of the town to fund the cost of replacing the existing artificial turf field and renovating the existing track surface and place the order question on the number fifth ballot. Um, with that, um, Tom, is there anything you'd like to yes, add? Yes, if I could. Um, late this afternoon and here at your desk this evening, uh, you should see a memo from Todd Souza, our Director of Community Services. Uh, as you may recall, at the meeting just a week ago, uh, and this actual order was postured starting at uh, the request to the uh, authorization of up to 1.6 million. The council adjusted that down in first reading to a million fifty thousand uh, dollars to reflect the amount that was uh, shown in the budget. Um, just quickly by way of background, uh, we undertook an RFP process. Uh, we did not have. Uh, detailed engineering done of, of the facility. Uh, the RP process, I, I think, uh, worked fairly well in this regard in that uh, we're relying on the, on the skills and the expertise of vendors to propose a solution to a kind of stated objective that we put out there. Uh, and we can learn a lot from them at their cost, not at ours. Um, because of that process, there's a lot unknown. And in particular with this project, there was drainage and subsurface uh, aspects that no one is quite certain of. And so understandably, many of the initial responses uh, provided some level of flexibility just for the unknown. Since then, in the, over the course of the last week, Todd Souza and I know Mike Legage um, from the high school uh, have met with uh, a number of the vendors and actually continued to have detailed discussions with two of them that they have kind of uh, vetted and, and prefer and uh, we're now comfortable saying that the to do this project uh, in our opinion the correct way that's the proper repair of the track and uh, proper resurfacing of the turf field uh, 1.2 million uh, would be sufficient to do that um, beyond that I'll just note that there is an existing reserve account that was established when the field was first built the intent and the hope was over time that would build to the point that there would be sufficient funds to actually do the turf replacement. Um, through a number of circumstances, um, that's not the case. The current balance is about $116,000. I would suggest that uh, we per perhaps could consider that as a contingency account that would be authorized by council should we find anything unforeseen. So. Uh, that recommendation would stand regardless of the amount that you approve. But our, our recommendation to you would be to ask the voters for $1.2 million to do this project um, the best way we know possible at this point. So with that, do any of the council members have questions for Tom or team on that issue? Hey, Tom, I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, council Ham. Uh, so, I mean, I saw the narrative and I saw the letter from Todd, but no, there's no real additional analysis to support it other than, you know, there's no, no new spreadsheet or anything, no detail supporting this? No, it's a, these are ongoing conversations, but we, we, we come before you with a lot more comfort in that number than we did just a week ago. And, and in our best professional recommendation, we believe this is the budget required to do the project correctly uh, for most cost effectiveness and longevity. So I guess with that, now I'll open it up to public comment. Would anybody like to come up and, and talk to this item? So um, I'm glad to see the investment of the town. This is a lot of money. People know me know I'm a fiscal conservative, but I believe in if you're gonna do it, do it right. So I have some concerns about uh, where the money was cut out of, of the kind of 1.6 to get it down to this 1.2 number. I'm a little concerned that I saw some of the bidders were more on the turf side, and I wanna know what concessions were made on the track side. We have really good track history here in Scarborough, and, and frankly, a great athletic program that's great for our community. So I want to get a sense of, is the track just being resurfaced? Are they taking it down to the grade? Um, what's the thickness of, this, of the track being resurfaced? So a lot of things that are really important to the longevity if we're going to make this big investment. 
for the future. Let's do it right. So I'd like to find out those answers, if at all possible. Um, I believe that these bonds are all going to be separate, so there's no commingling of funds, so that's a fair assessment as well. So that's all I have. I look forward to some answers. I don't expect them now. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to? I just had to follow up here, looking at the numbers again. So the number was reduced, was being reduced from the ask from 1.6 to 1.2 million. We approved 1.050, right, million. So, and then there was a reference at the bottom to other funds available to take care of contingency. So those to be included in the 1.2 million or would be available mm -hmm. to draw on over 1.2? I would say over 1.2. And, and typical rule of thumb, 12, 10 to 12% is a reasonable contingency in any project. These are funds that are controlled, they exist, they're controlled by the town council. So if, rather than asking 1.3 of the voters, we're saying, we're coming to you hat in hand saying, we think we need 1.2 to do this correctly. And if, should there be some unforeseen things that we don't know, um, there are other resources that we come back to you and, and seek uh, authorization to use. Thanks. Through the chair. So, so I just, I guess a point of clarification for me. Um, so this is to put uh, on the ballot a, a question for the voters to uh, approve the project, right? So I'm, where I'm uh, confused is if we think it's going to cost 1.3 with contingency, isn't that the number that we should put on the ballot? And then when we go to actually issue the bonds, if we think that number is you know, really 1.2, then we might say, well, we'll actually just issue 1.1 million in bonds and we'll fund the other 116,000 with this account. That certainly would be uh, one way to look at it, yes. Okay. Um, just because we have voter authorization to a certain amount doesn't mean you need to bond that amount. In the coming weeks, we will have uh, more detailed and, and even a better sense of what that cost is. But we, we believe 1.2 will be sufficient if for some for reason, unforeseen reason there are these other resources that could be tapped into. Okay. So with that, or just a second on the councilor comments, I think we're still in public comments, so we're trying to get, is there anybody else that would like to speak to this in public comment? Okay, seeing none, I'll close public comment. Um, so there's a motion on the floor. Is there a motion to approve the motion as it appears, at least on the agenda at this point? So moved. Uh, a second? Second. Okay, open it up. All those in favor? No. Open it up for discussion? Okay. Yeah, Council Donovan? I'd like to make a motion to amend uh, to set the figure referenced in the order in the two places it is referenced uh, at 1050000 to set it at 1.2 million. I'll second that. All those in favor? Discussion. Discussion? Discussion, anybody? Yep. Um, Council Hamill? This may not apply in the realm of politics, but uh, say what we mean, mean what we say. We approved 1.050 million, and um, I see the analysis and have heard the arguments, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that uh, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to vote in, in favor of the revised uh, motion. Uh, I think we were on the right track the last time we reviewed this, and there's nothing in the additional data that I find compelling uh, to change my mind. So and I think that this is a, hopefully a lesson that uh, you know, coming, coming into the budgeting process, I know there, you know, uh, there are unknowns and there are things that we can't always plan for, but uh, uh, I'm not comfortable adjusting this as the revised motion is recommending. Thank you. Councilor Cadrini. Uh, I definitely support adjusting this as you may or may not know uh, in the audience. I thought it was crazy to reduce it from the 1.6, like uh, the speaker, Mr. Cornwall, said. You know, if we're going to do this, we want to do it right. Uh, this is a huge investment in uh, our athletic facilities. Um, and like anything with construction, you get into things and all of a sudden it's like, whoops, we didn't see this or oh, we need to fix that. And I would remind the public that just because we authorize 1.6, you should put the word in there up to. It doesn't mean we're going to spend it. So we decided not on the 1.6, which was a disappointment to me, but I would certainly support the 1.2. But well, that's because I, I don't want us to be uh, penny wise and pound foolish. Thank you. Any other council comments? 
Um, well, I was wondering if we could hear from Mr. Souza because what one of the things that you know this memo says, which by the way did come out, I'm not sure when, but I, I was actually an email today, and uh, one of the things that makes me a little bit crazy um, on the council, and I've said this about many other issues, is um, trying to you know vet things in real time. And when we, and it says, I feel very confident with this number. Mm -hmm. and, and to Councillor Hamill's point, what makes us feel more comfortable now at 1-2 versus 1-6? Do we actually have uh, some, some spreadsheet numbers that you were sent, and why weren't we also sent those? Because I made the comment last uh, week, you know, that, that had this come in, you know, around this number before, I probably would have... Um, it was much closer to, to what we had put in the budget, and so I, was, I would have been more comfortable, but a, a $600,000 swing was a big swing for me. So now we're kind of like, are we just, are we, it feels in some ways like we're just throwing darts. So I want to see what the meat is behind those darts. Absolutely, and no, I appreciate the questions, and I can understand why that, um, and I apologize last week if I wasn't clear. The reason why we brought the initial 1.6 was we put this out as a proposal. We did not spend the initial thirty dollars to $40,000 engineering scope down a project, we asked for a proposal that we as the athletic department vetted through with, uh, we had a meeting in, in, uh, in the spring with high school coaches and boosters to find out what we wanted in this project, and we asked for the professional comments from the vendors to bring us back a proposal, and so that range was at that 1.6, um, and then we found out that we had to, about timing of this, that we had to bring a number quicker to bond, and so that's why we were on last week. Um, and so since that point from last week, the plan had always been to, we had received eight proposals from five vendors, knocked it down to three that qualified in our scope of work that we had put out in the RFP. Um, and then Mike and I had met individually with those vendors trying to bet down the project what it meant. And so then we could clarify what was important to us, what was not important. And so that initial 1.6 included their vision of what this should be. And so since that point, I've narrowed it down to two vendors and got firmer, detailed quotes back from them, um, but I'm still in final negotiations with them because we took away things out of the proposal where, to answer some of the questions, we had a priority on safety, uh, moving fence, uh, dealing with the base or repairing the base that the age of it, um, uh, the best track surface that we could afford to put in for value, and then also turf. And so a lot of the costs that are in there are around the track more than the turf in the sense of what is going on with this. Um, so getting down to these two final vendors, there's still room to negotiate. I received numbers from both of them that are around that 1.2 mark that I still think I can negotiate down to get what we need um, as the best value. We, we cut away things where inlays in the turf with, with, with logos they had imposed, color, color inlays in the end zone, things like that. Um, we've gone from, they were both, uh, proposed initially, replacing field goals, we're gonna reuse that sort of stuff. Things in the ground that made sense to move a sleeve or move a discus pit, excuse me, we tried to keep those because it makes sense why I dig up the earth twice if we're gonna do those things. But the, the add-ons, if you will, or um, trying to renovate new field goals or um, long-term pits, you know, as far as different values of those, those are things that we're negotiating down. And once I pick a vendor, um, then that vendor will be able to go back to their vendors and say, this is, the, this is where they want to be, and there's still space. You know, we try to negotiate increased warranties, all those types of things. So I do have those two numbers, but to be honest with you, I'm still working through the process to try to get both vendors to come down further to get the best value and the best scope of work. So it's a different process rather than us pre-engineering, putting it out there and getting the, the price, because that's the engineer's version of, of what it needs to be. And so kind of work to try to get us the best value, and so I'm still scoping on the project. So it's still possible you, you could hit the original number. Absolutely, absolutely. There are choices though because between the two vendors, one has given us an option to deal with the base, but until they open it up, they may not know what's down there. They may be able to get to the base, do some crack repair. They may come back when they open it up and say, the town should really spend that additional fund, but all of those get us under the 1.2. And so that's where that kind of contingency comes into play when we see those decisions because there is 30 years of surfaces under there of overlays that are just stacked up. And so mm -hmm. when you open that thing up, those are the decisions that we have to make along the way. But I've got quotes to do repair the base under that 1.2. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Any, any questions for... 
Okay, Councilor Johnson, sorry. No, go ahead. Silly question. Did our action last week help you negotiate a better price with the vendors? No, because that was always the plan. Okay. The, problem, the challenge for us is that we had the bond question to get to you before the, on the 28th versus the 4th. The goal yep. had always been to get to this point. But when bond council had asked to do that first reading in the staff, that pushed the, ex the process there. I didn't want to come with a number without sitting through. I spent all day of the weekend on the phone with vendors trying to negotiate this down to where we are. If we approved up to 1.6, do you think you would have put a, accepted a few of those fancy add-ons that you're not going to now? I think there's always that. Yep. I can't say that we would look at them because it doesn't mean that we don't need them. Yeah. As far as I, I can't say about the logos, but as far as replacing because you don't need the logos. No. Nope. <laughs> but again, you don't inlay the paint, and so there's cross maintenance wise, and so again, when something stitched and glued, yeah. it's there. I can rent it every day versus trying to send a crew out to paint it when a company or a university wants to borrow a field. That reduces our rental potential. So. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I just want to make a clearer point on the two weeks and, and why we find ourselves in this compressed time frame. Uh, because this was a proof of the budget, um, and this is what we've done historically, uh, that budget process, as you know, includes a first and second reading public hearing, so there's a process associated with that approval. <clears throat> in the past, for those, we've done a once and done before council. Um, our bond council has said, just to be cautious, kind of the belt and suspenders approach, Let's put it through the, uh, again, the rigors of a first, se first reading, public hearing, second reading. Uh, and that was two weeks that, uh, it, that, that we did not plan on. That was kind of a late word for bond council. So it came to you two weeks sooner than we anticipated it would. And we're now trying to make up time. <clears throat> Me? Yeah. 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 Thank you. I, uh, I, I support this uh, motion to, to move it to 1.2 million as well. And I, I think it might help to explain the process a little bit. There's three opportunities for the council to opine on this in the process. The first was during uh, the creation of the capital budget. And that's when the million fifty thousand number came up. And it was identified as an important project for the town to take on at that point. But to your point, we didn't spend $100,000 to dig up a portion of the track to understand exactly what's up there. So even now, there's some uncertainty, as you say, that you know the 1.2 might not be enough, but we think it's enough. Uh, what we're doing right now is saying, well, let's ask the voters if this is a priority for them. The council already said it was. So I, I fully support moving this forward. But then there's another checkpoint as well. If the voters do approve this project, when we go to bond it, um, which is when we actually take on the debt for it, There'll be another opportunity to, uh, for Todd to say, well, no, it's going to cost 1.3, or it might cost 900,000. And then we can decide if we want to use some of those funds to help pay for that. So yeah, I do support putting this in front of the voters. I had a couple other follow-up questions. So you talked about some measures that you took after the, uh, the, the meeting last week to negotiate with the available bids. Do you ever consider just pushing the reset button on the whole RFP process and asking for different bids? Um, to be honest with you, no. Um, because the process was always to work backwards from here. And based on our timeline, with the, the, the damage that was incurred from vandalism and mm -hmm. just that this will be coming on 14 years, we are down to thread on the turf as it lays. Um, and so if we miss this window to vet it in this, this election, and get it in front of these vendors a choice to plan for a spring. Um, we're going to be under the crunch to get a June time frame to get an opening from Good August answer. 1st is the goal. That's what we put in front of the vendors. Um, and Mike has already been working with his team to know that once we see what that scope is and they start opening stuff, it might be a lot of work for our athletic departments to wiggle that thing left to right spring or fall season to make sure we have a window, excuse me, to complete this project in a, in a, in a manner where we can then go through checkouts and training on everything on the way out the door, if so approved by the voters and the So, long answer, no. So have we reduced the scope of work at all? I know uh, you mentioned goalposts and logos and stuff yeah, like that, so, but in terms so, of essentials. Yeah, I know, great question. So um, initially right now, it's getting down to the final two and working this way. A lot of this has fallen on the vendors, both are very, that were down and very motivated to get this, and so a lot of this is coming from their end. Um, We've reduced, um, we have drainage on the end of the D zones. Uh, one of the vendors had asked for additional slot drains around when they reshape it. Um, 
uh, but there's ways to, to bring those drains back in, and so they've made some reductions in that. Our field really does drain well, uh, as it is, so that's, that's not a concern, um, as much as it would be if we had a problem with standing water. Uh, again, they had proposed red track, you go back to black, and it's $20,000. So all those color changes, inlays, we talked about logos and color offsets, while we proposed to see on TV, full color in some <coughs> Stitcher glue, it's ten, twelve thousand dollars So we've really kind of narrowed that back down to get, really what you see is what you're going to get back, but new, safe, with, um, you know, with a uh, little to change. Um, Again, reusing certain things, uh, things that we have removed, and again, part of this negotiation is how do we get some of these things back? The track program is requested getting power to the inside of the oval. Right now, they run an extension cord over the top of the track on a post for track beams. Those are things that we're still trying to renegotiate back into, but those are things that we had to cut out to say it's status quo. It doesn't mean we can't rework with the vendors and get this back into the proposal, but that's what Mike and I have to sit down with them and try to get it. Um, same thing with like long jump pits. Standard now, they've changed length. You know, do we get covers and trays to keep the area or do we reshape and get vinyl covers? So those type of things to reduce maintenance. Um, the big thing here was about fixing the footprint. We do have a fence that's technically too close under the new standards. How do we get that back and put that safety? Um, so those things were all in there. But a lot of it came from the vendors knowing they're competing against each other. I mean, right. I told them two of you. How do we get this done? And, and then finally, how, how was the, thanks, time for that. How was the turf replacement fund funded? So it's based on rentals that we get to use off hours. Uh, when okay. it initially was designed, what I understand is that we were one of the first and luckiest to have turfs, and so there was a greater use. Um, but as our high school program teams have developed to three levels, freshman, or first and second team, that number of hours has reduced, um, which is just what it is. Um, and so we have less opportunity to rent. So that's why that fund never grew, what Tom was alluded to earlier. It never grew like it would exponentially. Um, and, and a lot of that has seen the success of growth of our athletic department, both at a numbers level, but also at a competition level. So, Great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any additional questions for, for Todd at this point? No. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I guess where I am. Um, I won't be supporting moving this to 1.2. Uh, part of this conversation really encapsulated that for me. I mean, we started last week with 1.6, hearing that that's what we needed to have. In a week's time, that's gone to 1.2. You just heard that there's still lots of room in negotiation. I think Councillor Johnson asked the question, if we stayed at 1.6, would we have spent that? And the answer kind of was, yeah, maybe. Um, I think it's important when we do do budgets and the budget is approved and it goes to the voters and we look at it, it's important to have things dialed in and having the numbers. Um, it sounds like if we stay with the one point where we were, the budgeted number, there is that, that account that sits there that can get us close to that 1.2. I, I don't think we need to go to 1.2. I'm afraid if we say 1.2, that's what we'll end up spending. So I'm, I'm not gonna support it. I think we can do this for, for the number that was budgeted. I think budgets are important and we gotta develop some financial management accountability. We just can't keep throwing money at things. So I think there's an accountability to deliver what's in the budget. Thank you. Anybody else have comments? All those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed? Take us as 4-3. So it's back to the main motion as amended that it is amended to read authorize an issuance up to 1.2. Um, and with that, is there any further discussion of that item? Councilor Foley? Um, I would just add, I mean, I just want to, for the record, want to be clear. I have no desire to take away from safety, but I, I agree with Councilor Hayes. Um, and, I, and I also think that when you're playing with numbers like this, you've got to show the reasoning and the rationale behind it. You, to just say I'm confident. You know, we were confident that our mill rate was going to be between 12 and 14 percent, and we're not there. So things change, and, and we need to, I think, in order to uh, regain some public trust that I believe we have lost, um, I think it's important. Um, that said, I know this project is needed, and I am going to support, uh, you know, the motion going forward. Um, but I do think it's uh, something we have to be more careful of going forward. Any other comments? Are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. I guess so. All those in favor? All those opposed? 
Five two. Um, next item on the agenda is order number 19059, public hearing and second reading on the order authorizing issuance up to 660,000 in bonds of the town to fund the cost of a new pumper truck surface and to place the following question on the November 5th ballot. So with that, Tom, I, I think it's really no change or additional conversations. From no, us. as I mentioned last week, just to put it uh, in perspective, this is to replace engine two. Uh, in, by the end of its life, it will have served us well for 31 years. Um, and this will be assigned to the Dunstan station. This is part of the uh, equipment replacement schedule that's well traveled, well worn, if you will, and uh, this matter was approved through the CFP process in the budget. Is there anybody from the audience that would like to speak on this topic? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Motion to approve order number 19059. So moved. moved. Second? Second. 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 Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous, great. Next order is order number 19060, public hearing and second reading on the order authorizing issuance of up to 2.5 million in bonds of the town to fund purchase of land and interest in land throughout the town and for purposes of conservation of natural areas, providing public access and recreation and protection of wildlife habitat and scenic or envir environmentally sensitive areas and it places the question on the November 5th ballot. Um, again, this is a second reading. Um, is there anything new to share, Tom? I think it's pretty straightforward. No, there was one item just to put your attention to. Uh, the chairman and myself received today. We provided a copy of that. I believe it was a letter of support from C.D. Armstrong uh, from the long time involved with the Friends of Scarborough Marsh. Um, and with that, is there anybody from the public here to speak to it? Director of Scarborough Land Trust, and we really appreciate the, the council's careful consideration of this important issue. Um, this issue came before you right now because, as you know, for the first time since the year 2000, the town is without any available funds to put toward conservation of land. Um, we're, we are grateful, as a side note, to the council for your recent approval of um, the, the last bit of the funds for our, our Blue Point Preserve purchase. Um, and I just wanted to take a second to reiterate something. I know that you know this, but um, this is not the last time that you will see it if you approve it tonight. It will go to the voters, and then for every dollar that's spent from this fund, the town council and the Parks and Conservation Land Board will have a chance to weigh in and decide whether that's an appropriate expenditure. Um, that most people would agree that Pleasant Hill Preserve was, uh, was a wonderful addition to the town. And it brings more to the community than the 65 houses that were planned to be there. An analysis at that time also showed that the town saved a net of $2.2 million by, by investing in that and conserving that land rather than having a developer. So it's a fiscally responsible move, actually, to conserve land. Um, and the point that I want to make is that there are other properties like that out there. We don't know when the next one is going to pop up. There's a lot of pressure from developers and rising uh, land values. And we think, you know, at any moment, another Pleasant Hill Preserve could become available. And it would be just a real shame for the, uh, for the town not to have the ability to move. Um, so I'm here with, um, I think there are six uh, SLT board members here tonight with us. So uh, any of us would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? No, seeing none, thank you. So I guess with that, um, there's the order number 19060 is on the table. Is there a motion to approve? So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. Any discussion, comments for last time? Kate, that's a um, Well, I, I would just, you know, echo um, what Mr. Bard just said, we talk a lot about fiscal responsibility and, you know, land conservation is one of the best economic uh, engines, tools that we have uh, in terms of what we do for the future of the town. So um, I'm 100% in support. 
Yeah, it, I'm going to support it as well. And uh, I said this at our last meeting. My, my only hesitation was that this isn't something that was on the capital budget. And um, after doing quite a bit of research, I, I understand now why. is because we're not actually intending to bond any of these funds. It's an umbrella program. Um, so it is different than some of the other things that came before the, the council. What I would like to see, though, uh, going forward, particularly for you know, issues like the Blue Point Preserve, is let's try to incorporate those to the extent we know into our budgeting process so that we um, can be a little more thoughtful about which bonds we're going to issue each year. So. Thank you. Council Katarina. Um, I am fully in support of this for all of the aforementioned reasons. Um, I see this as a way to basically, I don't know, set up an equity line, if you wish, um, for the future use of the town in preserving land. As Mr. Bard pointed out, they don't always know. You never know when a, an opportunity is going to arise. And that doesn't mean we have a blank check here either as a town council. It's going to have to come back for every single time they want to spend something out of this. So it's not like... We're going to sell $2.5 million worth of bonds tomorrow and paying the interest on it. Over all this time, it's really setting up an equity line uh, is, is a, perhaps a good way to explain it to folks. So uh, I absolutely um, support putting this out uh, to the voters, and I will definitely be asking voters to support this um, when it goes out to, to vote. Thank you. Councilor Donovan. Uh, people support this for all sorts of reasons. Uh, the one that I think people who are fiscally conscious should realize that it is one of the best growth management tools that we have. Uh, it saves the town money in the long run. Uh, and uh, while that's not necessarily first on my list, I think the fact that I go by Pleasant Hill Preserve every day and I see the beauty of that open land uh, is number one for me, uh, but uh, but there are a lot of good reasons to support this, and I do. Uh, Council Hamill, uh, it's hard to argue with uh, the value and the cause and uh, uh, what this does for us in terms of uh, preserving our character as a community. Um, all great things and a terrific organization, very committed, very responsible. Uh, Scarborough voters approved the expenditure of $5 million over the past 18 years, and uh, it's taken them that time to, to, uh, to, to spend that, to, to set aside land for our future and our, uh, that of our children. So uh, no dispute with that. The, the issue is there's no immediate need, and that was uh, admitted by the folks that uh, spoke last week. And... Um, uh, so, you know, the question becomes, so why, why do we have to do it now and why in that amount? You know, why, since, two, since 2000 we approved five million and we're going to be appro approving half of that in, you know, potentially in November. Uh, the other thing I'd point out is when we talk about uh, funding things like this, we really don't talk about um, things like first year debt expense. And if you kind of add up what we're talking about tonight, that will likely be approved. Uh, you know, it's about $340,000 of, of uh, debt expense that we'll be experiencing next year. Uh, 81K uh, for the turf, 63 for the pumper truck purchase, uh, 194 for land trust. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, it, you know, we, we tend not to think in terms of, of debt expense. And um, uh, I think we need to start focusing on things like that and the, the fact that it's, it's really not going to be two and a half million. It's going to be a much larger number. Yes, uh, through the chair. Yeah. Councillor Hamill, my good friend. Um, the, uh, I don't know if you're mis misinterpreting something. This 2.5 million first year expense would not be incurred necessarily because no one's asking to spend any of it. All they're asking for is authorization um, for the purchase of bonds at some point in the future uh, for future purchases. And as I said in my comments, I, I see this like a, an equity line. 
um, that will be fully vetted every year. And if at some point in the future it doesn't look like it's the right thing for the town to do, to release bond funds for a purchase, then that town council at that time will have the opportunity to make that decision. But I think that to say that, I don't know what your number was there, but to say that that's what the first year cost will be uh, and make it sound like it will be next this year's or next year's cost, that's not true. Well, may, if I may mis respond to my friend and colleague, Jean Marie, <laughs> Uh, who people refer to us as the odd couple. So, uh, you know, we're, we're always willing to talk, so let's just put it that way. The problem, the problem I have with that is that let's, let's look at the numbers. Let, let's look at what we've appropriated in the, fast, in the past and how much was, was not spent of what we approved. Let's do, let's take a look at the numbers just for the heck of it. And then let's talk. So you may be right in terms of the year one impact, but in terms of what we do with the, with the money longer term and the trade-off the trade -off costs for, for things like that versus schools, versus uh, doing something for our seniors who are going to be packing up and moving away because of their new tax assessments, is, is this really and truly a priority? And are we really being honest with ourselves about it? It, does, it just means we're going to appropriate the money. We'll, we'll never really spend it all. I don't buy that. And I'm going on no data, but let's have a look. Um, Council. So I'd be willing to bet that we will spend the money maybe over a 20-year time period, but if we looked at the analysis and did the ROI on land that has been conserved, the money we have saved uh, our town and the beauty and character, for me, um, hands down, again, the best economic development engine we have and tool that we have in our toolbox. Um, and I just feel so strongly about it that I had to say that. And, and for me, I guess, question to town manager. Tom, mm -hmm. I, I don't know the answer to this. When we actually put something on a referendum and we authorize the issuance of a bond, does that have any, and, and I understand we're talking about the timing difference between when it's the authority to issue a bond at some point in time versus when we actually do. Mm -hmm. But does the, the fact that we've issued our, we've got an authorization to issue bonds, does that impact in any way our debt rating and, debt, you know, as, as Moody's looks at us and other, do they look at it as an outstanding liability or I think I think it is considered. Um, it's not reflected in our annual debt service, so we've not incurred it, but I think it is considered in that overall analysis because authorization is granted. Uh, so it's a liability. Just, it's, it's just a, like a credit card, uh, the credit agencies will, will look at your um, total allowable um, balance and assume that you're going to spend it all. So I think it is considered in that analysis, yes. And so for me, I think I'm in the same place. I, I echo everything everybody has said. I tremendously support the land trust and what we've done. I've worked on the properties. I really appreciate it. I voted no on the first read. I'm going to vote no tonight, not because it's a worthy cause, but because I think we're at a real risk of there are going to be three major capital items on this November's ballot. I'm really worried something's going to get voted off. And if it's if it's the track, you know, so I think in prioritizing what's needed in the community, clearly there's a need to resurface the track. I mean, there's been there's been a lot of there's lots of concerns about injuries. The fire trucks, we need to make sure they're safe. I had always favored putting this on the November, I mean, not the, the June ballot. There's nothing pressing right now. There's no need for the, for the issue. There's no properties available. I'm concerned that we're going to bump something off the November referendum. And, and I don't know what it is, but I think with the mood of taxpayers today, especially with the tax rate being something different than what people anticipated, I'm not sure it's going to be a very receptive audience when it comes to November. So I'm looking at it from a strategic point of view, not that it's the right thing to do. So that's just that's just where I stand on this issue. Councilor Kettering. Yes, and, and this is just a question through the chair to Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, am I correct in remembering that bonds were passed or the opportunity to bond for the sewer to go under uh, the main turnpike? And that hasn't been spent, correct? Correct. That authorization That's exists. just one. I just had to get I, I, I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion on this 
this item? It is a good example. Yeah. I guess. That, Councilor Foley? I, I just have to say, Councilor Hayes, I appreciate your strategic uh, approach. At the end of the day, um, I don't know that us seven get to prioritize for the town, and that's why I, I would say let yeah. the voters yeah. uh, prioritize, because sometimes I think I know what the voters want, and I'm dead wrong. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, that they're the ones that are going to say yes to the track, yes to the fire truck, and yes to land conservation or not. Um, so I, I, get, I get what you're saying, and I know there was concern to build some support uh, on the boots on the ground for this as well. Um, but that, for that reason, I refute your uh, analysis. <laughs> so with that, are we ready to vote? All those in favor? All those opposed? So I think it's 5-2. Next item is uh, order number 19064, 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the request for a special amusement permit for, how do you pronounce it? Tabard. 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 Uh, Main Racing LLC, located at 1 Scarborough Downs Road. Cody, anything we should know? Uh, we did send out the uh, letters to the, the butters within 200 feet. Uh, there were 74 that were sent out, and we received no comments back via letter or email. Um, and everything is in order. I would recommend this. Great. Yes. Is there anybody in oh, the sorry. public that would like to speak to this? Seeing none, um, motion to approve. I have a question. Oh, okay. Quick question. Okay. Do, we, do you know what they're doing? I'm just curious. Uh, there is an event that's, that's it's a gathering of some sort. I'm not they do it every year. Is this something they I, do every year, I think? They okay. haven't had this in the last couple of years. Okay. All right. Thank you. So with that, um, <laughs> is, is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? So oh, wait. I have it. What? what? I was tired. I thought we talked. I thought we talked after we seconded it. Don't we? I actually had an email from a constituent. That's I, about this specific okay. thing. So all right. All right. this is not concerts coming to Scarborough Downs, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, all right. That's what I was asking. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to ask. Okay. Yep. So you're good. I'm good now. All right. Order directive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Order number 19065. An act on the request to approve the name of. Ernest Minor, a second alternate to the Sustainability Committee with a term to expire December 2020 that was posted at the August 28, 2019 Town Council meeting and recommended by the Appointments and Negotiations Committee. Don, anything you want to share with us? Or? Um, I want to thank Tody for uh, reminding me to get this on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Is there anybody in the audience that has any comment, would like to make any comment? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Paul? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, seeing none, all those in favor? Seeing none. Um, and the last item, um, order number 19066, act on the request to establish an ad hoc committee, um, community center advisory committee and approve the charge for said committee. And Tom, I think yeah. you're, you're going to lead us through a I will do my convoluted best. process. Well, hopefully it's not convoluted. Um, as the council certainly aware, but the public may not, uh, the council held a two-hour workshop a week ago on this, uh, generally on this topic, but in specific, they spent an hour, you spent an hour talking about uh, process going forward. Um, a clear part of that conversation involved uh, the creation of an ad hoc committee to assist the council to study the possibility of the community center and a public private partnership. I had put together a draft that maybe served as a bit of a reference point for the conversation. Uh, I listened as intently as I could to councilor input and have produced a version for you this evening that's in front of you that I believe reflects at least the consensus opinions that I heard. Um, I may have missed some of those points, and in fact, I know Councillor Hayes provided a number of uh, potential changes to the document. And so what you have before you this evening, and I should mention uh, Councillor Hamill as well, uh, let me speak to uh, the first step first. Um, in my opinion, I looked through the Councillor Hayes' uh, suggested changes. There were a number of them that, in my opinion, seemed to be fairly benign and for which I expected there would be a fair amount, if not uh, unanimous support. So the first motion that's prepared reflects a number of small changes. 
you can see them for yourself. Uh, beyond that, um, there were a number of other changes, uh, five in total, and I suggested that they be brought up individually as motions, assuming that there may be at least some discussion around these, um, and I would encourage you to consider them one by one and, uh, and, and vote as you move down through. Um, late in the day, we did receive some further changes from Councilor Hamill. I beg your pardon, I just didn't have time to, to work with them, and so that's going to be something we'll have to struggle through uh, to, to bring forward any of those concepts. Uh, yeah, my apologies for feedback uh, that anyone is going to have to suffer through, but I, I, what, I'd like, what I tried to do, and I, I don't think really happened uh, completely, is I tried to piggyback on changes that Councillor Johnson had made. You know, I, th I thought uh, you know, Councillor Hayes, Chairman Hayes, uh, were, were fine. So what I suggest, if we're going to try to do a motion on every red one, which is Paul Johnson's, and every blue one or purple one, that's mine. Can we just go clause by clause? Because some of these I might, I might pull off as we go. Uh, so I was going to offer that as a process suggestion. Yeah, I'm, thank you for that. I think that could be helpful. I, I would suggest that you move through perhaps uh, Councilor Chairman Hayes's uh, first, because I think there's some crossover. Okay. And that will hopefully focus help focus any remaining issues, and I'll do my best to help help guide you through that. Great. So, so maybe before we, before we start, yeah. just be, with that sort of even convoluted introduction, <laughs> <laughs> is, is there anybody in the audience that has any comments about the ad hoc um, community center, advice, the, the document that was at least distributed with the packet of materials? Um, okay, seeing none, um, we'll close public comment. And so I guess the first order of business is to introduce the motion that we had, 19066. So we'll start there, I guess. Um, motion to approve that. So moved. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> okay. That's not a good start. <laughs> yeah, that's a rough, that's a rough start. Um, and then I, then I guess I'll introduce um, an amendment to that, which is titled on your desk, Motion 1. Um, which Tom has mm -hmm. provided, and the changes in there are in red. So I don't know what would be most helpful, certainly not reading it at all. Um, I don't know if you want me to go down through and kind of talk about the reasons, or if people just want to open up your questions. Did you offer the amendment? Yes. I can look at it. need a second, though. I'll second it. And so it's open for discussion. Johnson. Speaking strictly on motion one here, which is our standalone one drafter, I don't, there, nothing strikes me as too significant of a change in my mind. I, I do appreciate the lease slash build at it, at it. I think that, I think that's important. And uh, I also, I thought the previous quorum of four was too few. If we have a committee of nine, I think a quorum of few, uh, four was too small, so to speak. Um, with six, I am a little concerned because it is nine. There is going to be some attendance issues. So I could be talked into five, um, but I would vote for six. So I, I'm kind of going back and forth. But that's my only, that's all I have. So. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I will agree with my friend uh, the other end of the table, <laughs> Councilor Johnson. I, I put in here just that I would rather change it to five just to make it an odd number for voting purposes, too. Uh, for the quorum, so that was the only change I saw. In this. If the uh, person making the motion to amend wants to withdraw it and uh, make a motion to amend with five, then I would support this. So done. That's <laughs> <laughs> not very formal. But. <laughs> that was your. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll pull it back. Yeah. I'll second your new. Motion to amend. So it's this one as is with five. Yes. With five. With five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Anything else? That's a full. I, I would just say I would agree with Councilor Johnson and I can support this one as is. I I'm concerned about what we have coming up as being much more substance, substantive changes and it's a little bit of a hot mess, but we'll try to muddle through. But I'll support this first motion. So with that, with closing out the discussion, all those in favor of motion one as amended? Okay. 
then, then returning to the main motion, um, introduce a motion, a second amendment, motion, so-called motion two, which is shown under the segment that was schematic design and layout. Um, and then we can talk about that in, in detail. And it, what, just trying to change some language to include some type of survey of the community to determine what they do want in the amenities and the schematic design. Um, so I can answer a question, but anybody, uh, motion motion to approve? So move or second? Second. Second, second and yeah, first. Right. Yeah. And then open for discussion. Councilor Johnson? Uh, I, I agree with the spirit of it, except statistically valid is going to be a difficult thing uh, for seven councilors to come. In a perfect world, I agree. I wish we, yeah. I wish we could charge them with a statistically valid, but getting that coming to the consensus of what is statistically valid, separate of bringing out, you know, a former actuary or something, I don't know. I, it, that, it's just that's going to be a difficult goal to achieve. So I agree with the spirit of it, except the wording of it. I, I'm just a little, I'm a little nervous that that's going to make us chase our tail just a little bit. I guess. This point. Any suggested change? No, I don't have a suggestion. No, but I love other people's suggestions. <laughs> How about striking strategically yeah. just have a ballot? Well, yeah, statistically, yeah. Well, I said, I don't it's know. Yeah. 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 yeah, I, uh, uh, it, we could conduct a statistically valid survey of the community to come up with a list of what should go into a community center, but I don't think that's the option that we're presented with right now. Um, it's not uh, you know everything under the sun. It, what, I think what we're looking at is more narrowly focused, and um, we've got a partner who's already looking to build some of the components that they feel um, the community wants, and they're looking to see if we can um, partner with some things that we need. So I, I just think that it, it's not focused enough to, uh, for the committee to be successful uh, at the end. I, but to your point, I, I, I think you know, some survey or some discussion about community priorities or, or what should go in there is worthwhile. Um, I would not support a statistically valid survey uh, for the reasons uh, stated by uh, my fellow counselors. Uh, in particular, you know, how do you define statistically valid? And statistically valid surveys are very expensive, to be honest with you, or can be. Um, that being said, I would also say that when you when you go down this road, I see this ad hoc. It's ad hoc, which in Latin means for this purpose, as being very narrowly focused on. We have an opportunity in town, and is it a yay or a nay uh, for us as a community? to pursue something uh, with this particular uh, development. And I'd like to see this committee laser focused on that. Uh, and then if we need to expand their uh, vision or, or, or whatever we want them to do, then we can do that at a later point. But I, I think that conducting a survey is not needed at this point. I think what we're gonna have our uh, nine members of the public and four people who are <coughs> involved with the town from the school board and town council and I and they are representing the public in this so I don't support this amendment <clears throat> the uh, if you read the schematic design and layout section you'll see that the committee has the authority to go through a full process of review to determine whether or not this is the right combination of services and that's really what a survey would do. But they, if they determine that they need to take some steps to uh, identify to a greater degree than their collective knowledge about what is appropriate here, they have the, they have the authority within the, uh, uh, the charge as it's presently written. I guess where I was in reading that, what it seemed focused on is them just looking at what what has been designed by the staff today and we really don't have any validation other than anecdotal stories of just a great example is a pool versus not a pool i mean we don't have any statistic we, we have no data from the community other than 
you know, anecdotal stories and sort of when we were doing, you know, the comprehensive plan, the, the intent was, and nine people don't necessarily speak for the whole community. So it was really trying to attempt, there should be monkey surveys, something simple, just to ask people what are the critical amenities they need. That's all I was trying to get at. We don't, we don't know that. And I don't know if it can be recrafted in a way that meets everybody's needs. Um, the last sentence intended to speak to that. But the, the last sentence uh, says, public input on the proposed schematic design shall be solicited. Uh, so it, they have broad authority to uh, survey, I use that word loosely, uh, what the community's interest is. I just had a question. So when I was listening to the presentation by the EDGE, you know, we were talking about surveys. We quizzed them on their survey, and it was a Facebook survey. So there were on questions page, about on it. Their, so on the, their own page. So, so I kind of I understand, I think, what you were getting at here by, by calling that out. And I don't see how that is, uh, you know, in conflict with the, the last sentence that uh, Councillor Donovan had just referenced. <coughs> Any comments, Katarina? Uh, yeah, I also wanted to inquire. Uh, I don't agree with striking the sentence review the proposed schematic design prepared by staff to determine appropriate of amenities to be included in the premises to be leased by the town. I think they should be doing that, so I would not strike that. Because you also have that in this motion. Yes, that's correct. Right, I mean, I was trying to rewrite that. So, Re okay. Uh, yeah. um, but that was the intent, though. Oh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't strike that. Yeah. I'd leave so, that in. I guess we're at a difficult. Council Johnson. I, I, I do like, I, although you're just trying to restate the, the sentence before that we struck. I, I mean, I do like specifically stating modified the staff proposal. I, I, I do, I know that some of this can be argued that it's all saying the same thing, but I, I think there's some validity to the fact that we, we, uh, Mr. Souza presented a great little skeleton, right? But I think it's important that, that it's stated pretty clearly that we don't have to stay right in that. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's close, right? Or, or maybe it's not, I don't know. Right. But I, I do like the, I do like saying specifically that, Hey, this is this is this is Todd Susan's first crack at this. You know, we don't we can think outside this box, right? Maybe it's bigger, maybe it's smaller. What happens? So I just I do like you using the word modify simply to suggest that we're not in to, uh, Todd's first crack, so to speak. That so that was one of the strengths I thought of the edit, but that's where I am with that. So. Um, that's not. I agree with that. I don't that's see where <laughs> through the I'm sorry through the chair. Could you point out where you're talking? I don't know where you're talking. Maybe I'm missing something. Oh, right at the end of the new, it says design, review, and modify the staff. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Thank as you. Thought, Thank as appropriate. You. That's yep. all. Yep, yep. It's him trying to, I think, restate yep. the sentence before. That's all. But just make it clear. Uh, uh, Council Dunham? I, I agree. I, like, I mean, I like the fact that it's clear that the uh, committee has the discretion to modify the proposal that's presented to them. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have any objection mm -hmm. to including that language at the end of the sentence, which is shown as struck. Uh, so, so your proposal is to keep the, trying to do this on the fly, keep so the I first would, sentence and then, and then put in there that let, and modify the staff proposed. Schematic as appropriate. As appropriate. Yes. Yeah. And so if this motion that's to amend that's on the table right now, on the floor right now, is defeated, I would support a motion to add that language to the first sentence. Mm -hmm. so, so I could withdraw this. Yes. And then the motion would be to add that mm -hmm. to the sentence. Mm -hmm. Yes. Councilor Johnson. And stop me if I'm going way out of scope here, but... To, to maybe get to what you were saying, if we take the last sentence of the paragraph and say the, count, the committee's first priority shall be to uh, solicit public input, that might help strengthen the language about public input for you. Yeah. So if we took that last sentence and made that the first sentence and just say the first priority oh, shall yeah. be, and that, and then yeah. that kind of gets to what I think yeah. what your yeah. concern is. Yeah. It's not changing language a whole lot. And, and then yeah, they're gonna they're gonna have to decide 
their, their committee is going to have to decide what, you know, if they did enough. But if we say it shall be their first priority, then they sit around the table and say, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so can that I might be a way to yeah. bring us together on that one. So can I draw the motion as read and suggest as an alternative motion, I can, I can do that, right? Yes. To follow Paul's lead, put the public input as the first sentence. The public input on the proposed schematic should be the first sentence under the design and layout piece. That's what yeah. Paul just discussed. Take the struck, the sentence we struck, and just modify it at the end. I oh, know we don't have to modify it. It's right there, right? right? And I guess, do we want to say that the first priority shall be public input, just to give a little more strength to it? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I'm fine That's with that. Right. First yep. priority shall be. Yeah. Okay. Public input. So, Tom, can you maybe take a stab at reading? <laughs> sure. Reading <laughs> the motion. As I understand the motion, it would read as follows. Uh, bear with me. Uh, schematic design and layout. The first priority of the committee shall be public input on the proposed schematic design. Oh, yeah. There's a bit of kind of scrivener's. Shall you know, be to solicit public yeah. input to on solicit. the schematic design. Yeah. With particular emphasis on engaging community support for an indoor swimming pool. Review the proposed schematic design prepared by staff to determine the appropriateness of amenities to be included in the premises to be leased by the town and to modify the staff proposed schematic, schematic as appropriate. Yeah. And then uh, the, the remainder remains unchanged. I'll make that motion to amend. Second. Any further discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Okay. So back to the main motion as amended. Um, and then making a motion to introduce motion number three on the sheet, which really talks about just adding the second, uh, an additional sentence on the projected revenue fo forecast to have it confirmed by an industry expert. Is there a motion to? So moved. Second. Open to discussion. Councilor oh, Hamill. Yeah, I, I recall that we talked about this in the workshop, and there was a general agreement that we had done something similar to that with said code numbers on the Downs proposal. So I think that was, at least I recall, was connection to to this revision. Yeah, and to, just to speak to that, uh, my characterization of that that thought. Uh, was found in, could be found in um, consulting support. And I quote, if in the opinion of the committee that outside consulting support is required to accomplish the task, the committee is encouraged to advise the council immediately with specific detail of the type of support required and, and an approximate cost of these services. The town council will consider all reasonable requests for assistance. So I recall that more as a project management Assistance, uh, uh, okay. separate and distinct from the, uh, this one. Fair enough. I was just speaking to. I, I do recall the conversation. Yeah. I was trying to capture that notion in Great. that language. Great. It, Perhaps it actually, I failed. It could be, as you pointed out, it could be the same expert that can do both. Possibly. I think John. Yeah. Guess Sorry. I, just, I, I guess I'm not clear on what you would consider an industry expert. Like I know for aquatics facilities, there's companies that we could bring in that, that would be able to help with that aspect for, but for a community center. Um, well, off the top of my head anyways, I don't know who you'd bring in that would be considered an expert. Um, you could bring in a financial expert to look at the numbers yeah. and maybe an expert or a consultant to help guide what components or services you want there. But it just, I guess I'm not clear, so I'd, I'm not sure that the committee would be clear on, on how to fulfill that charge. I mean, what I was trying to get to is the projected revenue forecast okay. is going to be absolutely critical to the numbers. I mean, you know, we're saying we think it's going to be self-sustaining, so that's that's a pretty big number. I'm not saying that. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, we don't have experience in that, so the, the thought was the industry expert would be someone that runs these types of centers that have some type of ability to look at the revenue projections and say, yeah. Or no. Okay. That was the idea. It may not be clear, but that, that was concept. Oh, sorry. concept. I know it's a bad habit, but 
perhaps Mr. Souza could give us an idea of what, what we might add for language, or I, he might know if there's. It all comes down to scope. So you develop the scope, then you need, to, you need to bring in, sorry. It all comes down to the scope of the project. Um, because then the expert may be in that area, because depending on looking at the membership model, is that the greatest choice of revenue to offset things? And so how do you bring that person in to calculate what the threshold is? The sales are still sales, so they are projections. Um, and then what are those other spaces? And that's what the edge has kind of gone through with their model for the hockey rink and the turf, is still time slots. And then they decided, well, we're not ready for two sheets, we want one sheet. And so those, those impacts economically would be developed. And so I think you'd have to look at, I think it's kind of a loaded question. Yep, so. okay. Uh, I, I liked paragraph six because it, once the committee gets into its work, uh, uh, if in its opinion uh, outside consulting support is required, uh, we, can, we can approve it. And so that, that struck me as uh, giving them sufficient discretion to pick and choose uh, professional consulting assistance as needed as opposed to mandating and using the word I, experts was problematic for me. I thought this phrasing I liked better, and I thought it sort of responded to what the town council felt was an appropriate provision to have in. Any other comments? Um, so with that, um, I guess, it, no further discussion? Vote to whether this is this motion stays in or goes out. All those. Um, yeah. Can we sit one more? So, because I, I, I guess I'm stuck a little bit because I would vote for this as it is, but I don't like it, so I'm just trying to. Okay. Buy some time. So. You have a wordsmithing. Yeah. <laughs> The I mean, confirmed by, a, we could say Kurt confirmed by a third party as appointed by the a majority vote of the committee. Yeah, or in, con uh, yeah, no, in, in consultation with, you know, experts as required or, or as they deem necessary. I, I guess you can loosen the language. It, it, it seems directive, but not clear what you're directing to there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's covered with yeah. paragraph six. Um, the other thing I would just observe, paragraph Paragraph six gives them broad authority regarding any of the analysis, intended or not. What's proposed before you is limited to the, the revenue forecast, and uh, there may be value in outside consulting help across others. Mm. Just as a thought. I guess my only concern would be that if we look back at our experience with the downs, I didn't. If if this gets when this gets to the stage that the council's making a decision, I think that one of the things the council immediate want, that really helped make our decision was third party verification. was verification. So I can really appreciate what Peter's trying to do here because if the committee decides not to and then we move it to the next stage, are we going to then get hung up right. on a majority of the council or three of the whatever it happens to be is concerned that there's no third party verification. So I, I think this has some really good foresight to it. I think that it's worth maybe discussing this a little bit longer. If we are interested in making a decision relatively quickly, things that help make the decision quickly is to, we could put something in now that to foresee, you know, how, how do we get that validation? If we leave it up to the committee, maybe the committee feels so good about the work that they've decided it doesn't, That's and right. then a fresh set of eyes gets on it, and then all of a sudden, so I, I, I would just encourage everybody who, who wants to work on an accelerated timeline, I actually think this is a big, looking ahead three to four months, this actually, I think this is a big part of it, so I just want to get it right. And I guess that was my thinking, that the language in paragraph six says they may, that doesn't mean they do. And I think before, for me to do due diligence for fiduciary responsibility, just like we did in Scarborough Downs, I'd want to have the analysis vetted by a, you know, a third party. So to get to Councillor Johnson's point, that's what I was trying to set up, is that by the time it arrives at our table that there's some verification. Councillor Foley. So would it work if we just struck an industry expert and put by a third party verification as determined by the committee? And then you're also double covered in paragraph six? Would people, would that make you, would that achieve all the? Yeah. Confirmed by a third party. 
How'd you word that? Third party? I don't know. <laughs> Took from my third party. It's determined by the council. I, I tried to wordsmith it. Oh. <laughs> I can read it. Yeah. I'm uh, sure John's is, is better than mine. I, I, I would have bet on that, but it, it's longer, so generally I, I don't like length. But uh, So the, the second sentence would read, this analysis should consider a reasonable rate structure that is consistent with similar, similar facilities in the region um, in consultation with subject matter experts' experience with uh, the services and amenities agreed to by this committee. Mm. I like that. So I would draw my motion and substitute as amended by Councillor Clement and Tom. Did you capture I, I, most of that? Uh, I got the, no, I, I, I think you need to repeat it. So I, I, struck, I, I, I struck the and confirmed by an yes. industry expert and substituted in consultation with subject matter experts experienced with the services and amenities that have been agreed to by the committee or the scope of the project. That, <laughs> if it's in writing, that's fine. So does everybody kind of understand that you want to write back? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. um, this analysis should consider a reasonable rate structure that is consistent with similar facilities in the region and confirmed in consultation with subject matter experts experienced with the services and amenities agreed to by the committee. So my only question is, does that mean somebody other than SEDCO? Because the description of the experts could be SEDCO. As I, as I hear you read that. And that's kind of the issue I have. So not, we don't want to rely on just our own you know, staff or organization or, you know, hybrid uh, organizations to be something. if I could simply respond I think it would be foolhardy for the committee and I expect staff will be working closely with them to try to somehow short circuit the process because sure. they're going to get what they deserve so if there's a fear that there's we have to lean on this committee I, I think my expectation is that they're going to take their work seriously and they're going to do it as thoroughly as they possibly can I'm not sure if I understand the I, I don't understand suggestion. your response, so I guess we're equally confused. Well, there seemed to be a suggestion that SEDCO wouldn't be appropriate in your opinion. No, no. I think the suggestion was that, uh, like with the Downs project, that we would rely on some independent uh, resource to have a look at things. And it was focused primarily on the financials. And this is in the, the section talked about, talking about revenue forecasting. So yeah, I, that's, it's not, a, this is not a knock on SEDCO no, or a software program they buy or the consultants associated with the software program. It's, so it's an independent. Just, maybe just substitute with independent subject matter experts. Why would we want to do that? Wouldn't we want to be able to give the committee the discretion to use whatever professional consultants they deem necessary and appropriate. Yeah, I, uh, I wasn't thinking of Seiko when I yeah. uh, came up with that, and I was okay with the original wording, just to be clear. Um, and, and for me, because we're talking public, what, what's going to sell this or not is actually getting commitments from users to, you know, fill up some of the time slots that, that we have. And that, uh, so if we have, uh, you know, if it's a pool, you, you know, somebody who wants to teach lessons or uh, swim clubs or clubs that are willing to commit to using the facility, that's going to, I think, drive the answer that you're, I think, getting towards. Um, or that would be, to me, more valid than an outside expert coming in and saying that, yeah, you might be able to get, get with this size community, with this median income, this many um, people to sign up for swim class. It, It strikes me this language should give everyone comfort that we're going to be relying on experts experienced with the service and amenities agreed on. So yeah. it's not a it's off the street, it's someone that has particular expertise yeah. in, in these arenas. So I guess the motion on the table as Tom just read it, in consultation with subject matter experts experienced with, with the services and amenities agreed 
to by the committee. Mm -hmm. So with that, are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Yeah. All those opposed? Oh. What did I do to Oh, nothing. It was a great try. It was a great try. <laughs> Um, motion number four, back to the main motion, then uh, motion on the part, motion four, approved to amend the main motions amended to three time frame as follows. The committee shall advise the town council as soon as possible with their, respect, with their recommendations, but no later. Um, we originally had December 4th. Um, Paul has suggested <coughs> December 15th. Um, so let, let's leave it at yeah. December. Or 15th. December 15th. Huh? What, what are you doing? Motion four. Yeah. Motion four. Motion four, oh, so motion five. Oh, I'll continue it. So forget, forget motion four. And Not necessarily. No, we want to preserve that was your, I believe, that your proposal. <clears throat> no, I'm okay with. Okay. As. You want to skip four and go to five? Yeah, skip four and go to five. Okay. Yeah. okay. That's fine. Okay. Makes sense. Um, so the motion is, is motion five, but the report out is done by December 15th. <coughs> is, is what was recommended, is, is the suggested language, and strike the first part. So I'm, I'm it's going to be moved. I'll move it. Okay, okay. second. second. Yep. Yeah. I second. Uh, you didn't. Council, I just I, I think I'm a little conf I, I did say December 15th, so I just want to give some background. I think everybody at this table has heard it at one point or the other. I think uh, Bill and I had discussed. I liked the idea of having um, actually Bill, Tom, and Peter and I, I think, all discussed at different times. But there's a difference between the, these guys reporting out and us voting on it, right? So I was pretty concerned with the timeline um, and. Uh, what I'm thinking, and, and I, I agree that the date that we vote on this should not be in the committee charge because this is a committee that says, so I, I, I understand, but in an effort to at least buy us a little bit more time, I think I had negotiated with Peter, and I don't, I don't Bill, I'm not 100% sure if we did December 15th or not, um, but it does give us two more weeks, which if we do look at, <coughs> we are dealing with Thanksgiving, so we are dealing with nine people, we are dealing with Thanksgiving, we are, we're already dealing with an incredibly accelerated timeline. Um, I would go later than December 15th, but I feel like it's, this is more of the spirit of the consensus at the workshop, so I didn't want to go too far off the rails on what the consensus was on the workshop. So that's where the December 15th number came in. Yeah, I mean, uh, I see your point. Yep. And it's one, it's one more meeting because add 14 days to yep, December right. 4th, yep. and they would be reporting out to us on December 18th. Uh, uh, I guess in the spirit of compromise and interest to give them more time, I would support this. Councillor Campbell? I'm fine with extra time, but what does the report constitute? I know we've struck the language that says that there would be a specific recommendation. I'm assuming that would be, and I remember the dialogue was pretty, pretty active on this, that we thought, if possible, they could make a recommendation on the, on the proposal that was in front of them. Uh, and I thought uh, there was other discussion to the effect that they could make a recommendation on needing more time right. in order to make a, a quote-unquote recommendation. And that's still in here. But it's yeah, so that's still in here. here. Yep. So, so you're... Just soften it from... Right. It's a report as opposed to a final recommendation on a proposal. You know, yeah. Paul's, you know, I mean, it'll either be one of two things. It'll either be the final recommendation right. or it'll be the report right. that they need more time. So the report gives them flexibility that it would just be an update and we need more time. It wouldn't be just that we got to give a yes, no on the, right? That's, that's that, how that's, I understand it. And maybe that's concept. not going to be reflected in the legislative record, but that's, that was my question. That's a concept. So any further discussion? I think all those in favor? And I will withdraw the last motion six. So it's back to the main motion as all the amendments. And then I think that turns us to Don with ever. Don, you may have in the queue. Yeah, I, I wanted to run through this. And part of it may have, I may strike some of these. And sorry to be the, you know, the caboose on the train here, but. Um, 
you know, I came out early and I felt that a lot of stuff that I had proposed was, was pretty much tossed out. So I came back around again here in the 11th hour. So thanks, Tony, for adding this. And apologies to the committee for, uh, you know, to the council for, uh, you know, this dragging on. Uh, the, the first one I'll talk to is uh, uh, the blue wording at the uh, schematic design and layout. Um, this may be more appropriate for when the committee is in actual operation past the, you know, past the recommendation phase. So uh, if that's the case, I'd strike this. But if this is a committee that we expect could be commissioned then to carry on with the work like the um, Public Safety Building Committee, then uh, I, I think we need to be clear about making sure they, they have project management expertise that will help bird dog our, our cost and keeping things on on schedule in terms of uh, time frame and that sort of thing. So that, that was the intent of the wording. I just want to ask a question on that. When we did that with the um, Public Safety Committee, did we then um, edit or advance a different charge when they when we ended up con continuing their work? Is that how we, it worked? So to Don's point, this would be if, if this committee were to be charged with moving forward, this would be a few part of a future charge, perhaps, because I can see that playing into yes. it in that regard. I don't know that it's necessary now. Hmm. Yeah, and, and Does do that make some, sense to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. In the answer to your question, Councilor Foley, I think wasn't it a different team that actually it was a subset of the main team that they right. followed. It was, there was of components of both. Yeah, it yeah, was ad hoc. Subs. They completed their initial task yeah. that went away, and then you reconstituted them. Right. It had a handful of the. Right. Oh, Two-thirds of the original yeah, members, but a different charge. Yeah. So there would be a process of recommissioning, and then the ad hoc right. com committee would be concluded. Yeah. Okay, fine. Then I'll withdraw this motion. Right. And, and the, just so you know, the ad hoc, what that what that means is it's not standing. Once it once its charge is met, it it's gone. Right. self destructs I, I have a little more to say on the ad hoc committee, the meaning of ad hoc, but I'll save that for <laughs> some other time. Uh, Maybe a little bit later this evening. But on the next one, um, we are focused on lease build and we think primarily a lease arrangement. Are we quite certain that there will be no chance we would capitalize this, you know, uh, a community center? Guys, if we are, then I will withdraw this. If not, um, I think it needs to be included. And even if we are talking about, um, you know, lease, lease build, uh, uh, structure, uh, we still need to talk about trade offs. So that was the intent of my of that wording. Council uh, Dunder? The baseline analysis, I think, assumes uh, uh, a capitalized venture. Uh, so I think it's in there. I might suggest a, a, that we need a second just to, to get this matter up for discussion. Yeah. Second. Oh, sorry. Second. <laughs> so, Councilor Jones. I guess um, the way I'm looking at this is it's, and I could be wrong here, but if we don't, if we don't enter in with this agreement with the edge, this is going to go away for a significant amount of time. So there won't be any debt burden that we're, I, I'm, I'm, this is an up or down vote on if we're going, essentially the, the, the most. Right. The task at hand, or the most, the current task at hand is like yes or no to the edge. And in my view, if the answer is no, that we're, the community center is probably getting shuffled behind the school and all that, all, all in the library. So to me, the, the debt analysis is more of a decision making mechanism on the partnership with the edge. So I think it's important, but I don't think there's a chance that. Our reaction to the edge isn't going to, going to be no to the lease, but let's go try. Let's go ask for twenty million dollars. It's going to be no to the lease and see a community center in five or six years or seven years. So I, I guess that's where I am with this analysis. I think the analysis is more of a decision-making mechanism. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, it can be picked up later. I just that's where that's where I am for the committee right now as it's being formed. Mm -hmm. So the, the wording, yeah, the, the yeah. wording as is, I think is it, it doesn't really fit with the title. So I think this is probably not not precisely worded. The, the issue I have is, are we certain that we're not going to have any discussion of a capital deal, a deal involving capital, 
and all these other things. This is kind of like, you know, this is a speech, the, the narrative here. But if, if there's a chance we're going to talk about capitalizing it uh, during the, the term of the ad hoc committee, then I think that needs to be referenced here someplace. The word capital's got to be in there someplace. Okay. How about if in item two, which in the original document is item one, we have lease slash build, if you made it lease slash build slash capital Perfect. Cost. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I'd withdraw the motion with that yeah. proposed revision. I could go with it. Yeah. Got to have that word capital in there. So uh, that motion is withdrawn in... There's a replacement motion to add the word capital to lease slash build slash wherever capital you see, cost. Wherever you see lease build and capital. Yeah, do we want to do that globally on the document? Or? Just, you the, want, just in this one section or all? We could do it global. I mean, it, it makes the most sense under item two. He did. I doubt yes, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't hear that, Tony? You missed that part? So moved. Second. Um, so I guess we're any further discussion on that particular one. So I think we're at we the motion is to just amend item two to analysis of expected lease bill slash capital cost. There's four places. That yeah, there's four changes. places where it shows up throughout the document. Right. Yeah, they're identified in motion one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're amending yep. is the motion one that was yes. passed. Yep. Motion to amend number one to add the word capital. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. All those in favor? Okay, great. Thank you. That was easy. That was easy. <laughs> So the next one, it's along the same lines. Uh, it's this item. It's under uh, other uh, other analyses. You know, this was struck completely last time, and so I put it back in as it was the first time. So sorry, yeah, I didn't. It's this one. It's the blue one called establish a budget. Yeah. So the concept of an ad hoc committee without having uh, a budget discussion or deliberation of of any kind and not referenced at all in uh, other analyses just seems uh, a little bit scary to me. Now, here again, I, the narrative is uh, pedantic, you know, and it is, uh, you know, uh, it's a little bit over the top, so I can whittle that down significantly, but I like capital. I think that a budget's got to be in here someplace. Other committees have done that. Uh, we did it, you know, we did it uh, before, and I think that will be a key element. Um, so before we start, a second to second? Yeah, I'll second so, it. Okay. And I also have a comment. Yeah. Um, I, when I read this originally, um, it, it's the council's job to determine what can be af afforded with, with things. I, again, it goes back to I see this ad hoc community center advisory committee is telling us straight up, yay yeah, or nay, without getting into, you know, we make that determination, we get the report and then we decide from there, you know, what, whether we can afford this or not, is it budget or not, um, but that's my opinion. That was my note, it's the town council's job. Yeah, I agree with that as well. But I think it's our job to determine afford affordability. They're gonna come to us with a proposal, uh, That'll have some numbers, and then we have to decide if, if it's something we'd be willing to move forward with. So I, I think I get the drift here, and can I offer some alternative uh, mm -hmm. wording mm -hmm. in, the, in the spirits of the feedback that was, was given? Thank you. Um, I recommend that we uh, leave, establish a budget, and then uh, we would strike this in, entire thing except for the second sentence that would read, Develop a budget with various levels of amenities, equipment, and services, striking, good, better, best. So that's period. And then maybe one more sentence. Discuss and recommend a process and timing for initial review and approval by the town council. The end. So I'm going to read that again. Develop a budget with various levels of amenities, equipment, and services period, discuss and recommend a process and timing 
for initial review and approval by the town council, period. So is there a second for that? I'll second it. Discussion? Much better. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Oh, 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 no. Yeah, already yeah. Well, he, asked, he asked for discussion. Could I have it read to me one more time? Develop a budget with various levels of amenities, equipment, and services, period. Discuss and recommend a process and timing for initial review and approval by the town council. I can I get strike initial just for review and approval by the town council. Discuss and recommend a process and timing for review and approval by the town council. It's two senses. I have a question. Yeah, no, sorry. I have a question on that mm -hmm. through the chair. That's better. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you, when you mean develop a budget, are you saying that, that when they are looking at whether we're going yay or nay, you want them to go further and say, well, a pool will be this much, but uh, something else will be that much? Is that what you're saying? I, I, I'm confused, I guess. Well, uh, we're talking about having this group spec and validate a proposal, so I'm assuming that, that would include detail on what would be included and in the costs for that. So does that then become a budget, or is that a starting point and the budget gets de developed later? I, I just, you know, do we, you know, my, my request is to try to develop enough of a budget so at least there's something to go forward um, for the next phase of the committee. That was the thinking. I understood the financial analysis sections, subparagraphs one, two, three, four, and five, are essentially a financial analysis that goes through all the steps. I wouldn't call it a budget, uh, but I think it goes through all the financial steps that we all have been talking about as being essential to allowing for a judgment on the affordability of this proposal. So I think it, this proposal that's being made now is redundant of the financial provisions that we already have in the agreement. Mm -hmm. Council Johnson. Yeah, I think the word budget is difficult because that's that's we're deciding if it's if if we have the budget for it or not. Um, a cost revenue analysis or something like that would would make more sense in my mind. I I actually like the good better best. Um, so if you look at financial analysis, subparagraph two, a complete evaluation of expected operational costs is essential for analysis. It, we could add to that, that we could break that into the three tiered system of good, better, best. I think in a, so my I mean, I guess I, my question to you, Councillor Hamill is what's the difference between what you wrote and a complete evaluation of expected operation cost is essential for the, this analysis. So I will answer your question with a question. When would budgeting occur? And the reason I ask that is because when the public safety building uh, was underway, and my, my wife was a member of that yeah. until you know they reached the 18 million mark and then it went into the 20 million mark. But they started with the budget and the budget evolved over time, but that committee started with the budget what we're talking about here is having a committee starting with analyses and then how do you make a decision without them recommending a budget for the town to approve and fund and appropriate. So that's, I, I don't know the answer to the question, but that was the, the reason for my yeah. adding it. Can I, can I respond to his oh, question yeah, with a question yeah. then? <laughs> I guess I'm understand. I mean, to, to simplify this, as, it, to me, to boil this down as simple as possible, in my mind, I'm thinking we're going to be looking at a net operating budget, bottom line, and we're saying yes or no to it. So we're either going to, so I think the way you're doing that is we should set that now. Like, let's say we will accept no more than a net operating loss than $100,000. Then they have a budget and they can work within that to see if that's possible. But the way this is structured, I think they're saying, hey, this is how much it's going to be if we're going to do it right. And you tell us yes or no if you're willing to absorb this net. I mean, it's going to lose money. So, the, so our question is, how much money are we willing to have the town lose every, every year? And, and then we vote on that number. That's my understanding of it. So I think that's why budget is confusing in the, in the language. That's all. So. Mr. Chair. 
Um, I, I think we're getting too into the weeds with establishing a budget. Again, um, this is an ad hoc advisory committee advising us on whether or not we're going to follow through with some type of a partnership with mm -hmm. this particular entity. Uh, I think that budgets come later. Um, and, but I think, you know, I think we've addressed financial analysis and what numbers look like. And again, you know, ultimately it's going to be the town council who's going to make decisions. Councilor Johnson? Uh, I agree with the comments made by Councilor Johnson. The net operating loss is going to show a certain amount of money that has to be made up with the general fund. And that number, the town council will look at that number versus the uh, uh, baseline analysis, uh, and neither one may be acceptable. And at that point, that's from which negotiations I could envision taking place with EDGE that we can't afford what's here, uh, so let's negotiate something we can afford. Uh, if we think that whatever that negotiation is would result in a good deal for the town. But that's how I would see that in the Sorry. end working out. It's a chicken or an egg, okay? Mm. It's an egg as an analysis. It's a chicken when it breaks out of the egg. It's a budget, okay? So tell me when that happens. So I'm happy to, and this idea is fluffiness. So when did the budget happen under the downs? When did that happen? What was this, an analysis and then, well, it actually was negotiated and we voted on it um, at the end. You know, the, the budgeting and the negotiating was done before the council saw it. So this is my reason for dancing on the head of this pin. Yeah. It's a key question. And I have a similar revulsion to the idea of talking about numbers on this scale and a commitment like this with all kinds of analysis and independent experts and so forth. And nowhere in the ad hoc committee charge is the word budget. Maybe uh, to bring us together here, I, I, I don't have a problem with saying budget somewhere in the document. Where I think it might fit is in the motion one amended financial analysis item two. It currently, I believe, reads a complete evaluation of expected operational costs is essential for this analysis. We could add there um, and a determination of the budget impact. Uh, and I, I think there's going to be two, two impacts. One's going to be the capital lease, and the other's going to be the operational yeah. you know, yes. surplus or deficit. Uh, and, and they should be able to give us some, some rough numbers for what that impact's going to be before we've done any negotiations, of course. So under financial analysis, subparagraph 4, which says combined analysis, uh, the lease and operational extent expenses should be considered against the expected revenue so as to identify any gap that, na that may, may need to be covered by other sources of revenue. Insert the word budget in there. That's, that's the point at which mm. it's, the, it's the shortfall. We're falling short of calling it what we want it to be. If we're comfortable with this, then uh, I kind of get the idea, okay? If we're not comfortable talking about a budget, then I, I have real issues with that because that's our, it's on our domain as its council to appropriate and to, now whether we get recommendations and develop a budget as a council or whether they recommend a budget, it's gotta be there someplace and it's not there now with this wording. But what Councilor Donovan just suggested, does that do it for you? Pardon? And he was going to add budget here? Or just say sources of revenue, including a budget? Councilor Donovan, you would suggest Yeah, that. I'm trying to see where in subparagraph 4 uh, and identified as combined right. analysis. Well, you have general tax support there. So to me, that gets to it. I, I'm not opposed to throwing the word budget in there. I just haven't quite figured out exactly how to work it in. Yeah, my problem is I don't think we figured out where a budget is gonna fit in this process and I feel really uncomfortable commissioning a committee to make a decision or recommendation on this without pinning down if they don't give us a budget then when, you know, or recommend a budget for our approval, when does it happen? 
How does it happen? It's not an analysis. I mean, it is a financial analysis, but not the same as a budget. So is there, is there a suggested amendment to this from anybody? Mm -hmm. Council Johnson? So, so through the chair, you're talking about the operational budget of the facility, is that correct? But isn't that going to be determined on a million factors that they're trying to sort out right now? It could be a million dollars a year, and it could be $500,000 a year, depending on the scope of the project, right? Is, but you're talking about the operational budget of the facility. I'm, I'm talking about it could include its capital. It can, could include uh, funding, yeah. you know, uh, in the current budget through expenditures or other sources. But... If we talk about doing the analysis without pulling together in a budget and a specific proposal supporting the recommendation or telling us how and when that's going to be resolved, I, gotta, I have a real problem with that. I guess at this point, without sorry, let's any take a yeah, up or down. Up or down, yeah. move the question. All those in <laughs> favor of it as amended, you recalled it and amended it to the two sentences, right? Is where we were. Which is what we're yeah, I had to yes. develop under establish a budget uh, with some bullet item. Develop a budget with various levels of amenities, equipment, and services. Good, better, best. We'll add that back in. Discuss and recommend a process and timing for review and approval uh, by the town council. So, all those in favor? Not clear on it. All those opposed? Five two. Okay. I didn't vote. No, you didn't vote. No, I didn't vote. You didn't you didn't uh, well, I I heard comment over here that we, people weren't clear. Uh, well, I'm not clear what you meant by budget. I said that. Sorry. Um, I wasn't clear by reading this, so I wasn't sure if the committee was going to be clear by reading this. I, I, because And I kind of view it as two things. There's our town budget, right? And there's an impact to this project on that. And I think they should touch on that with their combined analysis. Um, but then there's also the budget for the facility. And I'm not, I'm not clear on what you mean by budget, yeah. I guess. Well, I, I, but think, I think we've already voted. We've already voted. Yeah. It's not anyway. a, it's, it's clear we, we're fine with no reference to budget. So that's, that speaks mm -hmm. for itself. Thank you. Okay. Energy efficient, the, your next item? Uh, let's see. No, I'll strike that one. Energy efficiency, strike that one. Uh, and the last one on time frame, I uh, I think we covered that uh, yeah. sufficiently under uh, Councillor Johnson's provisions. And that is all. Okay, so now we're back at the main motion. <laughs> As, As amended. amended. <laughs> As amended, which I yeah, haven't been approved. How to rephrase at this point. Um, I, I don't either to do it does, does anyone feel it? I think we understood each amendment yeah. that was approved. Does anyone feel the necessity of having a. I'm ready to vote on the main motion as amended yeah. these several times. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to have some discussion, and I know the hours late. But we talked about, and I, you know, I love people who quote that. You know. <laughs> so it's an ad hoc committee. Uh -huh. And uh, we said in the workshop we wanted it to be, even though it was ad hoc, for a specific purpose. We said that purpose, as I understood it, included two things. And I know Councillor Johnson spent a good mm -hmm. deal of time talking about this. Mm -hmm. I may have forgotten it or who knows what. No, but, you're right. Yep. Okay. But we talked about... We're okay with doing this. We're okay with vetting this thing that's right in front of us, and tell you know, telling the community we got to do that, and oh, forget about the why or anything else. But we're going to do that, okay, ad hoc. But wait a minute. We said we were also going to entertain other ideas. Should they develop, or should this lead horse drop dead? And that is a you know a by ad hoc committee. That that's for the purpose of vetting a proposal, but also considering other options. And I do not think that even with this motion, as energetically revised, accommodates that. I still think the way this is framed is very narrow, and it will 
in effect, preclude the opportunity of considering other options. Councilor Caterina. Through the chair to the manager, okay. ad hoc committees can be amended, correct, if you wanted to change the scope of them? They through, can. A, through action they of the council? Can. Uh, regardless of the, the Latin meaning of the word, I think what, what is, uh, I don't mean to dismiss that, but what's relevant here is your own, um, you define what an ad hoc committee is, and it is essentially a committee with a specific charge and a defined duration, as opposed to a standing committee that continues to exist. Um, so I'm, I'm just I'm going over the... Paragraph five, uh, four. Expanded charge if the opinion of the committee, uh, the public private partners, not worthy of consideration by the town town council, will consider expanding the charge to the committee to consider other alternatives for a community center. So we provided for the right, and I think Councillor Johnson and I talked about this, and I thought this was good language that was added to address the fact that we are keeping all options on the table. That is a very narrow door, a very small opening in a window. And you talk about refining the charge. They're basically resetting this committee for another ad hoc purpose. So I do not think that in any way gives equal footing to consideration of other options. I do not believe that that captures the spirit of what I thought uh, Councillor Johnson was talking about. Well, can we? So I think where we are, we've gone through, unless you have another motion you want to introduce at this point, I think we've kind of circled back to many amendments to the first motion. And as Council Donovan asked, is people fairly clear what all those changes are? Yeah. And it sounds like we're ready to vote. There's no other questions. Yeah. And Don, I think your question, do you have a specific amendment you're putting back on the table? Yeah, I don't, unfortunately, I do not at this time have alternative wording, uh, and, uh, you know, my apologies for that. So, uh, I, but I, I, I really I, believe this is, I mean, you're having people dropping off the committee because of uh, how this is being worded. Okay, we're, we're going to see and hear more of that. So if I understand Jean Marie correctly, if Don came up with language by next Wednesday and wanted to add to this, we could do. We could make an amendment as early as our next meeting. Is that correct? I'm looking through the chair. Through the, <laughs> whoever, whoever can answer that yeah, question. The it's not matter. This is scheduled on your agenda to be right yes. for amendment. This is the time but, to put it forward, not next Wednesday. It's now. No, I'm saying we would go ahead and vote. We would put this forward. The but then, if we wanted to add to the charge, we could. Is what is what you were. We were it would have that, to right? be not next week, but next down meeting. the line at some point, at any point. Yeah, the matter would have to be added to your agenda, and then it's certainly discuss about a specific <laughs> change. So, right. so if that's a possibility, Don, that there's a window to do something with that. Yeah, that, that, I understand how it's written, how it's drafted, uh, and I don't like it. I don't think it fits with the spirit of where we started on this, but I think it is entirely consistent with how we've approached this thing and running down the road. Uh, on this since March, so I'm, you know, I, I'm accepting it for what it is. Okay, this so one. vote on the yeah, amend, uh, motion as the as amended. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? We're, we're just we're voting on all the amendments, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, everything all wrapped up. Yeah. 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 So I think it's six and all those yeah. opposed. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Next item oh, is. Um, Non-action item, item number 10 is standing and special committee reports. Maybe start, uh, I don't know, probably there's not a lot to report since last week, but. No, nothing. No. Okay, Councilor Johnson? Uh, no, nothing. I have none. Councilor Katarina? I'm sorry, I have to uh, report. Okay. Historic preservation met last night and um, they are moving ahead, the foundation's been poured, they're looking at sills and whatever on the schoolhouse that we um, mm -hmm. said that we would uh, provide some money for, so I just wanted to let you know that. That's it. Council Donovan? Nothing further. Council Hamill? Uh, yeah, I, uh, there was one change that uh, we had in appointments uh, 
a negotiations committee meeting um, that was scheduled for uh, yesterday, and we canceled that primarily because uh, we were going to spend some time talking about uh, assisting the uh, the staffing uh, of, of this committee. Uh, the council decided to have the town manager uh, recommend that and utilizing town staff. Mm -hmm. So that is the reason for why we, mm -hmm. we canceled that. Um, and with that, I, I don't have any either. So with that, town manager? Report. Yes, two quick things. I beg your indulgence. Uh, public safety building, just to tell the public, uh, we do expect the tower, erection of the tower to begin uh, shortly. So you'll see activity on the other part of this uh, new parking lot. That will take uh, three to four weeks, perhaps five, uh, depending on progress. Uh, as part of that, and really as a function of expanding and connecting the parking lots, we will be losing our row of parking, uh, that row closest to the new building. And I mentioned that uh, as we move into the absentee voting period, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be having town staff park behind and make the front lot available. So we'll do our best to accommodate um, during the election period in particular. Uh, Two last things. Uh, we are scheduled to, uh, to go back before the, the law court. This is on the tax appeal matters that are going back for a second time to law court. Oral arguments are scheduled for September 25th at 10.20 a.m. They are very regimented. Uh, but 10.20 a.m. here at the courthouse in Portland, I give you more details. And lastly, Carpenter Court. This is the project uh, for Habitat in partnership with the town of Broadturn Road has a dedication ceremony on October 17th at 5 p.m. And I'm pleased to send that around if anyone's interested. Um, thank you. The, the Petron case was when? October 25th at 10.20 a.m. at the Federal Courthouse. Federal? Uh, Superior Court. Superior Court. Um, council member comments? I'll start down the other end. Council Hamill? Yeah, I'm not sure this is the time to, to make a motion or a formal request, but considering how the evening has unfolded in the late hour, but I, I feel that we are at a deficit in terms of uh, the measures that we have, uh, that we as a council can recommend uh, to help us bolster our remaining work on the uh, Revaluation and assessment process. You know, it, everyone acknowledges that's going to continue for not a period of days or weeks, but for months. Uh, and I think that's going to require uh, more work, more attention, and and potentially more resources. So, you know, I'd like to propose um, that we consider having a workshop. I'm not going to make a formal motion for that this evening. However, I'd, I'd like to appeal to my fellow counselors based upon the feedback we're getting and. Um, the fact that we just have a lot of analysis and a lot of information that we're due to look at that I think would be best done um, with us um, taking the initiative rather than relying on the public to bear the burden of that. I think we owe them that. Yeah. Good point. Councilor Thank you. Uh, I agree that I think a workshop would uh, uh, be a good idea to uh, uh, see what we've learned and what kind of guidance we might want to give uh, uh, council committees on the reval process. I think keeping it in front of the community in terms of a discussion helps people to understand that uh, they do have time to take advantage of the opportunity on any questions they might have. So I, I would endorse that idea. Uh, <clears throat> today, uh, uh, the town manager, uh, David Buffard, the assessor, Councillor Hamill, and I attended the mediation on the Piper Shores uh, 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 litigation. There's, for the public's benefit, there's pending a uh, exemption uh, appeal as well as a soon-to-be abatement appeal uh, uh, on uh, the assessed value of the property. Uh, I think it became clear to all of us attending on behalf of the town as we sat and talked about it for hours, and we were there for about four, four hours, that uh, there will be a lot for all seven of us and the town manager to learn in the months ahead. We have motions for summary judgment filed by both sides, 
and for the public's benefit, summary judgment motions mean judge, just decide the case. The facts are really not in dispute. Uh, we'll each side presents the law. Uh, those motions have now been filed in the last two weeks. Uh, uh, responsive pleadings, memos of law in opposition will be filed in the coming weeks. The argument, oral argument will be held in a month or two. Uh, <clears throat> the abatement appeal will be filed, we're told, by uh, the Piper Shores people will be filed in the next several days. Uh, uh, and we indicated to Piper Shores that Councilor Hamill and I did not feel comfortable making a proposal and settlement in light of all that we're going to learn about the nature of these appeals in the, in the next two months. But we did say that we would <clears throat> conduct a, an executive session uh, with Council so that all seven of us are fully educated on where things stand. These are fairly significant appeals, involve millions of dollars of assessed value. Uh, and, that's, uh, 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 and that's where we left it. No further offer and settlement was made by us, but merely a commitment that we would be looking carefully at it as a group in the coming months. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just, as I was sitting here tonight and <clears throat> we were discussing various things, um, I just thought it was, I thought it was a good meeting. Uh, I thought there was a lot of good um, discussion among everyone, a lot of uh, respectful disagreement and agreement. And I think getting through that document was a bear. I mean, yeah. trying to keep track of motions is like, okay. Um, so, you know, I, I congratulate my fellow counselors on getting it done. Um, and I, I feel like um, we were kind of humming along tonight. So that, that's my opinion on, on how things went. As far as the... Um, I, I, the um, assessments, I, I get frustrated when I hear these conspiracy theories, there's some conspiracy theory out there that, I don't know, the KRT wasn't doing their job or whatever, whatever. I mean, it's a stratified uh, process. It's not in the hands of any one person other than eventually it's the assessor who makes the determinations. So you've got KRT goes out there, they do a massive assessment of properties, and I do think it's important, you know, to think about how many properties were they even allowed to get into or able to get into or not. And it's not like me doing, or Katie Foley, who's another realtor, um, going into an individual property and we can pull specific properties and, you know, adjust specifically. It's not as easy as that when you're talking about what, 9,000 properties, or however many properties there are. Um, and, and so I, I fully appreciate the fact that the assessing office, you heard Mr. Uh, Buffard, he's willing to talk to people. He'll sit down with them, and as I mentioned in my comments prior, prior to um, now, um, people who have talked to him individually or talked to members of his staff have been pretty satisfied when they've left the ones that I've talked to. Um, yeah, they're frustrated. Yeah, it's more money. I mean, I personally, I, I've taken a huge hit, but I was also undervalued for a long time, so I get it. It's my turn to pay what I should be paying. Um, so, you know, I just wish people would turn down the rhetoric a little bit and, uh, I don't know, stop talking about conspiracies and move on. <laughs> Talk to the assessor. All right? Thanks. Councilor Foley? Um, yeah, I, I agree a lot with what Jean Marie just said. Um, I, I know there are a lot were a lot of mistakes. I know there's a lot of um, concerns, but if people can't get themselves in here to have those conversations, uh, I, I, I'm, I'd be really curious to know what they expect us to do differently or what the other options are, because we don't really have a whole lot of other options. We can't stop the process, we can't stop the town, we can't, you know, stop providing the services that people need, um, and uh, to do so would be majorly disruptive to everyone's lives and detrimental to uh, anything moving forward. So get yourself, if you have concerns, get in here and have those conversations. 
um, it's accessible, it's there for you, and you need to take advantage of it. Uh, I, you know, I do think there are, have been a lot of inconsistencies, and I totally understand. I mean, I have a house that, that said that it's all wood floors, and there's not a wood floor in the house. Hmm. It's carpet and vinyl. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. That's not changing the value uh, by twenty or $30,000. Hmm. So um, use the resources that we've made available. Other than that, uh, I don't. Happy uh, back to school, everybody. Hmm. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Says the teacher. Boo says the teacher. Um, so I have four things. Number one, just to, I, I, I'm not opening up business here, but to go back, I was a little confused at the end. I thought we were voting just to solidify all those amendments. Uh, Councilor Hamill, I do want to agree with you. We did talk specifically about bringing the committee charge back to the CEA, and I do think that was a consensus. So I do think you have valid points on that. Um, you know, I. I know this isn't the appropriate time, but there's a side of me that, you know, I'm, I'm, I think the school should be priority anyway, so there's a side of me that I, I don't know if I care anymore, so to speak, for that, which sounds bad, but that's where I am. Uh, secondly, as far as the committee selection, I think it's important to know we're having an executive session to actually uh, pick people, mm -hmm. so I believe we're going to see every single applicant that comes to the door, and, and we as a council are going to get behind closed doors and... Um, pick the appropriate people on the committee, which I can't wait to, to do. That's going to be super fun. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, if we got through this document tonight the way we did, we can do anything. Uh, Tody, thank you very much for helping tonight because I think without, <laughs> without whatever you put in front of us tonight, that none of that would have been possible. Yes, very great. And lastly, uh, to, to not to, I'm not trying to appease Mr. Hamill too much here, but I actually, I would love at the Finance Committee to see the last five years of uh, bonds that we have approved that are up to amounts and how much we actually bonded out of that. I think that would be a really cool exercise to see. You know, if we say it's 1.6, has it been 1.6 or has it been 1.4? I think, I, I understand the context in which you guys were talking about it, but separate of the land trust and separate of, Gene Murray, I forgot what example you brought up. The, the sewer. Yeah, the it, separate of that, it'd be really nice to see the last few elections, the last, the, the bonds that we voted on. How much of that are we bonding? I think that's, are we at 100% of what we are approving? Are we at 82%? I think that's a great, fruitful conversation to have, so. I, uh, Don, as the chair of the finance committee, I, I think that'd be a great thing to discuss when we'll work on the time's right appropriate. Plus, it creates more work for Tom, and that's <laughs> <laughs> we're all winners. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, to Paul's point, actually, that's what I spent the past couple of days trying to chase down: is what are our authorized but unissued bonds? And I did work with uh, the town's finance director to find that information. So I. It was helpful for me to see, um, and I, I, she actually did mention that the, <coughs> periodically they do come back to council to rescind um, bond orders uh, that are no longer needed, so, and, and that there might be a, a reason to do that sometime soon. So uh, it was extremely interesting. I, uh, me, I'm a, somewhat of a data junkie, so the biggest thing with the reval for me is that there's a lot of really useful information there. I, I know that people speak to the, uh, you know, the quality of it, and it's subjective uh, you know, when you talk about data quality, right? You, you can't afford 100% quality, but this is pretty good data. And one question that it's uh, raised for me is, you know, we missed the uh, impact on the tax rate estimate by a bit. And to me, it, when we did the budgeting process, right, we expected our values to go up 1%. Uh, the explanation for why we missed it, I think, has something more to do with our commercial values didn't go up as much as we expected. So that's something that I'm going to try to dig into um, and see if maybe there's room for, to improve in the future. And, and certainly, uh, to your point, I, I would support uh, a workshop to look back at lessons learned. And, and certainly, if I see anything in the data, I would say so. I don't think there's any conspiracies out there. I, I think everybody's doing as good of a job as they can. And, and in the end, the process is designed to be redundant and work. Um, so that, that, that's where I'm at with that. And then the other thing is, uh, I was happy to see that we actually have some candidates um, running for the different offices in uh, November. And if anybody wants to sit down and talk about what it's about, I've enjoyed my experience this far. I'd be, I'd be happy to meet with anybody. He's still a rookie. <laughs> <laughs> um, in pivoting to that, um, and 
seeing that it's late, I'll keep it short. But speaking of candidates, we do have a slate that has it's closed. It's all done, right, Cody? It's closed down. So for town council, there's there's two seats, and we have four candidates: uh, William Donovan, Betsy Gleetson, Ken Johnson, Robert Rob, <laughs> Robert Rowan. Um, School board, there's two seats for three-year term. It's Alicia Giftos, Anna Lee Rosenblatt, Brian Shumway, Kristen Turner. For the sanitary district, two seats for three-year terms. It's Joseph Carroll and Paul Rodriguez. And the sanitary district trustee, one seat for one year is Ruth Summers. Um, and we had talked about, and thank you, Councilor Hamill, about the suggestion of the workshop. Tom and I did talk about that today, and Great. we'll see if we can get that next Next Great. town council meeting, which is the 18th. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, thank you everyone for your patience Thanks. tonight. And with that, as we approach 10 o'clock, who won tonight? Just just before we <laughs> oh, close up. I, I see, so I think, I think that if you're over an hour off, that you shouldn't, it shouldn't even count. The whole meeting is thrown out. So nobody was within an hour, but <laughs> if I have to give it to meeting. somebody, it's right. Paul. <laughs> so with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. All in favor? All in favor? He has been. Thank you, everyone.